Okay. I swear I'm going senile. I started this script like what, back last November, October? Got distracted by other things, and by February, I'd forgotten this video even existed. Now it's September again, and I wanna scream. Maybe I just wanted to purge it from my mind, who knows. And while we might be able to count ourselves lucky on this, I was partially using Kiwi Farms to keep tabs on this person after their Twitter was taken down in the rare instances where I would remember this script existed. And now that site is sorta gone. Like I said, reasons to be thankful, but also reasons for me to get off my arse and actually do things in a timely manner and screenshot the things that I'm supposed to. Lessons to learn and all that jazz. But whatever, it's been what? Almost a year now? Actually, almost exactly a year, a little over. I can make it like an anniversary of awful type thing. And it's perfect for spooky month content because lord knows, I'm gonna scare ya. Fuck. <laughs> Frankly, I don't think too many of you guys care when a video I cover was made, so long as you get some juicy, long-form content to draw to, am I right? Well, charge your tablet pens, because we're about to get started. So, hi, ho, what's the dealio? Look, I'm not gonna mince words with you, we're covering a pretty gross subject and a pretty gross person today. I know I'm supposed to be moving into less stressful content and all that jazz, but truthfully, I started this video back when the video I'm covering was still up, and it was relevant, and if I just wasted all that frelling time I spent looking into this disgusting mess, I think I'm gonna have an aneurysm. So we're just gonna avoid that outcome for now. Cool? Cool. Now, there's a lot of reasons why I wanted to cover this video, but at the end of the day, it really boils down to my noticing that nobody else really wanted to cover this video or the arguments made by its creator in depth. In fairness, I totally get. People would rather just dismiss the arguments with, no, you're gross, stop talking, not have to do any mind-numbing research on it, and just have it be done with. Problems with that. See, the person we'll be looking into today was in the process of building a community, and they were targeting minors, arguably both publicly and privately in order to do so. One can surmise that a lot of the arguments they laid out for us in this video are either the same arguments or variations of the arguments they would use to make those minors believe that their point of view was valid. Because that is what they did, and we'll cover that too. On the one hand, I understand the stance of not wanting to platform these beliefs simply because of the nature of them, but I equally understand that without easily accessible information directly countering some of these arguments, impressionable individuals individuals, usually children, can be groomed into these damaging belief systems. In particular, a lot of the arguments we'll be going over today are presented in a manipulative manner, which we'll discuss when appropriate, and all of which are red flags that people without the correct information on hand might overlook. Hence, my goal is to deconstruct those arguments to the best of my abilities and present to you exactly why they are disingenuous, manipulative, or red flaggy. Some of you might think it unnecessary, and that's totally fine this video probably isn't for you then. The difference between us is that I do think it's necessary precisely because I've seen this very thing happen and, while not directly in relation to this user specifically, in relation to this topic. Not only am I aware of a user from a community that I've spoken about in the past who as a preteen was groomed by an older predator into believing that their particular brand of paraphilic criminal actions was okay, something the minor had since gotten therapy for and overcome. When I was first looking into this, I also came across comments from other users on videos covering this subject espousing similar stories. Namely, they had also been tricked by a predator into thinking that a paraphilia was just totally normal behavior. Specifically, the paraphilia will be covering, meaning that this experience isn't especially unique and that children, not knowing the manipulative nature of the arguments at hand, can be indoctrinated into some seriously harmful beliefs. Now, normally, I wouldn't just believe leave comments at their word, but in this case, I'm going to err on the side of caution. So today we're gonna take those arguments, pick them apart with a fine-toothed comb, analyze them with some weird science-y devices, and really get to the bottom of how they potentially convinced people in the first place and why they're still wrong. I also preemptively apologize for the lack of art footage you're gonna see in this video. Frankly, unless I reused a bunch of footage you've already seen on this channel, there was no way I was gonna have over three hours of footage at my disposal at any one time. 
So, sorry about that. Enjoy my feeble attempts at Minecraft instead. Put the kettle on, grab yourself a snack, and snuggle up with your fur babies. Lord knows you'll probably want to keep them close after all's said and done, because you'll definitely need that extra calm to help you through these stormy seas. There are some things talked about in this video where I think the deplorable nature of the action doesn't need to be explained. People hear about it and they get an instant reaction. I'm not gonna denigrate your intelligence by implying it needs to be spelled out for you why these actions are an issue, but bad people who can convince you that they're good can also convince vulnerable people that their actions and beliefs are good. This is my counter to that. I'll not mention what it is just yet, as the subject I'll be arguing the points of uses this same tactic of obscuring the topic she's talking about, but on her end, it's a means of preemptively painting it in a sympathetic light. This is also my counter to that. Plus, you know, if I'd say what it is before a certain minute mark, YouTube Senpai is gonna have their way with me tonight, and I'm a small person, there's only so much punishment I can take. Alrighty, with that all said, Hypnotist Sappho. <sighs> Hi everyone, you all know me as Sappho, and I wanted to make a video about coming out. Coming out with anything can be very difficult, especially if it's something that society currently views with disgust or is a bit dangerous to even come out with with the way that things are right now. Right off the bat, through her wording, Sappho has conveyed a couple very simple ideas to us about the subject she's portraying, despite not having yet revealed what that subject is. She's implied the subject could be a sexuality given her usage of the term coming out, which is socially understood as the action of revealing a personal intimate aspect of a person's identity, such as their sexuality or preferred gender. She's implied that she's potentially in an amount of danger to be revealing this, making her seem brave for taking on that risk. She implies that, while currently viewed with disgust, what she's revealing could be accepted in the future. And it's a lot like when homosexuals were coming out in the 1960s, during Stonewall and those sorts of events. Again, using implications towards sexuality, this time directly comparing it to people campaigning for equal rights and to end unjust discrimination based on their sexuality. Which, outside of how disingenuous the main point of this video is, how full of yourself do you have to be to be like, yeah, me making this video is akin to a series of demonstrations in response to what was effectively unconstitutional homophobic harassment for their sexuality. You know, since you could be arrested for being gay or not having the right genitals for how you're dressed. Especially given what you're going to say after my next two interjections. Oh, something I also just noticed while I'm sitting out on the porch with my dog writing this, while I've had her sped up because she's annoying, Sappho speaks very calmly and slowly throughout the duration of this video. If you had seen her other content, you would probably know that this isn't unique, as being hypnotist Sappho, she performs hypnosis sessions, what are effectively guided meditations in VR chat. But I do want to point out that speaking in that exaggeratedly slow, calm, relaxing voice, is generally a means of lulling the listener into an emotional state where they are more relaxed, calm, trusting, and open to suggestion. You know, just something to consider. And I know that 99% of my viewers, my community, you don't have anything wrong with homosexuals or gay people. You support them, you support LGBT, nothing against them. But I guarantee that many of you, even if you can't imagine it now, if you were growing up in the 1960s and we're being fed all of the news and social propaganda about how gay people should stay in the closet, how it's unnatural and against nature, and all sorts of crazy shit like that, a lot of you would probably be anti-gay, anti-LGBT. And that's just how it is. Here she plays to the sensibilities of her audience. Nowadays, people are relatively more informed on the plights of the LGBTQA community and the sort of discrimination that they face on a given basis, at least when compared to 20, 30, or 40 years ago. Sappho also belongs to the furry community, which has a long history of trying to be all-inclusive and safe, especially with regards to sexuality. So most of Sappho's audience are likely, by default, going to be progressive furries. She's right in saying that most people growing up in an environment steeped in homophobic propaganda would in turn display homophobic belief. But in stating this, she's also directly implying that there's a wealth of modern day propaganda vilifying her alleged sexuality. And therein she's making the implication that the only reason people would react negatively to her alleged sexuality is because of the propaganda they're fed. Which then prompts the audience for the notion that they have been brainwashed against this concept. This is how Sappho prepares for the reveal of what her alleged sexuality entails. And I respect you all, 
and frankly, this sort of thing would have leaked out eventually, especially with how cancel culture is these days and other furry drama. Implying that she could be canceled for her sexuality. This should already be setting off alarm bells in your head. There would be people out there that, you know, they want to have a, a gotcha moment. They want to build their fame and popularity and, you know, expose people. And <laughs> I, I'm just not going to get the opportunity for a Sappho exposed kind of video. And I would rather suck the air out of the sails of the Ransonas and instead of letting this sort of thing build, just be open and honest about myself and my beliefs. Yeah, so remember when she compared what she was doing to the Stonewall Uprising? That thing that was incited by a long history of people being arrested for their sexuality and was particularly spurred on by yet another homophobic discriminatory event, particularly a police raid. Yeah, nah, Sappho's just doing it cuz. Yeah, ironically, she just provided easy rant material to anyone who was having a slow content week. Well, it doesn't matter anyways, uh, because Sappho's lying. This whole, I'm gonna do it preemptively so they don't have the opportunity is bullshit. Sappho's actions were exposed by Matcha T Tiger, an ex mod from her Discord, literally three days before she put out this video. Matcha T Tiger accused Sappho of showcasing drawn bestiality porn available in her Discord's Not Safe for Work channel, failed to adequately keep minors out of those Not Safe for Work spaces and activities, and said that, when asked, Sappho claimed to feel that zoo files were misunderstood and that the act of bestiality wasn't wrong, both unnerving things to be suggested. However, since that post didn't get a whole lot of traction and didn't have any screenshotted evidence, Sappho opted to try and get ahead of this and then just pretend like it didn't exist and wasn't the reason for her coming forward in the first place. Sappho's trying to save face whilst pretending like she isn't trying to save face and never needed to in the first place. More reason to not trust her, I guess. She can't even be honest about why she's making the video. And I want to clear the air and say that, for the record, I am a zoophile. <coughs> you did not mishear that. I am a zoophile. What the hell is this? I do not have a thing for humans. I am more attracted to dogs like German Shepherds. If you are willing to stay and listen to my view and explanation, that is the point of this video. It is to show that there are ethical guidelines. It's not so black and white like many furries think that it is. And a full explanation as to the way that I think and the way that others think and why. Forewarning, this video does not provide a full explanation regarding this stance. So if that's what you expected upon hearing that, uh... Sorry! Zophilia is often very misunderstood. That is actually true, but in the context that the paraphilia, zoophilia, is often conflated with the act of sex with an animal, bestiality, which aren't inherently the same thing, the former describing the mindset of an individual and the latter describing the act, which is actually the thing that is criminalized. But in the context of people understanding that it involves a human being that wants to screw an animal, people are usually able to clue in on that aspect fairly quickly. You can have a zoophile who engages in bestiality Bestiality, but not everyone who engages in bestiality is a zoophile, and not every zoophile engages in bestiality. If you've ever heard of non-offending pedophiles, it's kind of like that. People diagnosed with paraphilias generally have a compulsion and intrusive thoughts regarding a particular action. In the case of zoophiles, it's bestiality. But there's also research to suggest that thoughts of bestiality can be an early sign of psychosis, a notable tidbit to consider, and something that will come up again before we're done especially because of certain very terrible people and what you may have seen in the news. And someone that I will not mention, if you remember that situation with the zoosadism leaks a few years back. Unfortunately, when people think of zoophiles, especially furries, that's the person that comes to mind. That is the situation that comes to mind. For those potentially unaware, she's referring to what is commonly known as the Caro situation, or the zoo sadism leaks, where multiple zoophiles were exposed via exchanged images, videos, and telegram chat logs, the most socially popular one at the time being Caro the Wolf, hence many people knowing the situation by his name. These leaks showed people sexually and physically abusing dogs, among other animals, effectively using the poor things as their playthings with no regard for the well-being of the creature. There were images and videos of animals who had been killed killed and mutilated, and then sexually abused once more after they had passed. People exposed in the leaks were exposed for zoo sadism, necrophilia, pedophilia, bestiality, and for a couple of them, probably a little more. It was a disgusting situation through and through. Sadly, most of those exposed in this fashion couldn't be charged because of how old the evidence against them was. And I'm talking about horrible abuses. And I'm not accusing a certain individual of anything here, but those leaks showed some truly horrendous people doing awful things to puppies, dead animals, animal gore, and other atrocities that I really wish would have been prosecuted, but unfortunately most could not, either by legal technicalities or so on. And it's a really sore thing for me because 
I would have liked to have seen justice in that case. I really would have liked to see that justice. But just because somebody was not charged or prosecuted does not mean that they were not guilty of what those videos showed and what those logs showed. And I will leave it at that. That statement is gonna come back in the form of the gods distilling pure irony into the form of a shark ready to bite Sappho on the ass. I couldn't imagine somebody doing that sort of shit to my animals, my mate, my- Stop! I just, I can't imagine who would harm another living being in those ways. And to be 100% clear, I am not like that. Most of the zoo community is also not like that and utterly despises it. Speaking broadly for an entire community of people rather than just yourself as an individual, despite not actually knowing those people in said community and therefore having nothing to substantiate or justify this broad claim? Brilliant! Love it! My favorite thing! People who force animals into situations they don't want, physically and through other means, are completely deplorable and seen as rapists. Playing with an animal that is not sexually mature is like the equivalent of pedophilia and it's treated as such. I do not support those people, and they do not deserve the same title. They are fetishists and bestialists. I do not want them to be the face of the community, and they should not be the face of the community. Forewarning, Sappho cites the words of people who effectively are fetishists and bestialists based on her own definition, so stay tuned for that. It basically destroys all of her arguments in one fell swoop. It's pretty exceptional. It's like literal Nazis considering themselves furries in the fandom. You don't want them. We don't want them. We don't want that image to be what people think about. Yeah, but if a Nazi self-identifies as a furry, like, what are you gonna do about it? You can eject them from the community as much as you want, but not only are there going to be furries who are totally okay with their presence in the community, because you can't speak for everyone, uh, you also can't really stop someone from identifying as a furry. If they're a furry and they're also a Nazi, they're still a furry. You don't just get to arbitrarily revoke the furry card for users you don't agree with the politics of. Caro the wolf is a furry, but he's also a degenerate dog rapist. You can despair at the notion that Caro is the most widely recognized zoophile out there and he's connected to some pretty horrendous acts, but he was still a part of the community whether you want to acknowledge it or not. And some people in the community still support him, you know, gross and dumb as that is. So Sappho doesn't want people to acknowledge zoophiles who harm animals in this way, despite the fact that, you know, if they're attracted to animals, they would still be zoophiles, regardless as to whether they act outside of Sappho's arbitrary rules for how real zoophiles act. Ethical zoos are not like that. Incidentally, the people who put together the zoosadism leaks were also zoophiles themselves. They just took issue with other zoophiles harming animals to this degree. If these were those ethical zoos Sappho is referring to, people who go out of their way to expose those who harm animals, I mean, that's not too bad. If a large enough number of zoos made an effort to disavow and expose those who harmed animals and didn't engage with animals themselves, they probably would have a much better reputation. But uh, problem with that, See, Sappho kinda doesn't do that, in the sense that she doesn't disavow those who have been shown to have harmed animals. Oh, she makes you think she does from her mentioning the Zeusadism leaks, but as we'll see, she doesn't apply those standards to everyone equally, and she's more than willing to promote someone who harms animals as long as it aligns with her own goals. Zoophiles are among the most caring and loving people towards animals and their mates. Rated where? And rated by whom? By other Zoophiles? Surely the group that would produce the most accurate and unbiased of reports, considering, to our understanding, they are suffering from a paraphilia that causes intrusive thoughts involving holding power over a weaker creature, and they try to rationalize that destructive behavior so as not to see themselves as bad people. So yeah, based on that knowledge, we literally cannot trust zoophiles to be completely forthcoming in this regard because they're deliberately lying to themselves and others to justify their beliefs. As Sappho has already indicated, coming out as a zoophile is socially taboo, and regarded negatively, meaning that zoophiles don't make a habit of exposing their real identities online. We'll even see an example of this a little later when Sappho interviews one of her zoophile companions who opts not to reveal his real name, despite apparently being out to his mom and friends and proud to be a zoo. Don't exactly sound very proud when you're hiding like a coward. So. How has someone managed to conduct a secret survey of zoos that accurately examines the level of quality to which they take care of animals? How can you rate who loves an animal more? Answer, you can't. This is stupid. We see animals as equals to humans, 
not as property or an object like in the eyes of the law and others. The claim to this practice is not possible. Firstly, with regards to the care of the animal, do you consider them an individual or do you classify them as a dependent? Well, obviously, any pet animals such as dogs, cats, lizards, birds, rodents, guinea pigs, and others, as well as domesticated farm animals such as cows, horses, goats, pigs, and sheep would legally be classified as dependents, primarily because their care and well-being is completely dependent on a another person. Any animal under your care would be classified as such. They cannot take care of themselves. The human provides the roof over their heads and the food in their bowls and the water they drink. The human is responsible for recognizing the signs of illness and taking the animal to the vet or treating behavioral issues when out in public. The human pays for grooming and other general care needs that an animal might otherwise have an aversion to. Any person in their right mind understands the consequences of an animal biting someone or hurting another animal or even humping another animal when the two haven't been spayed or neutered because humans have the capacity to understand the consequences of these actions, whereas the animal that person is taking care of doesn't. You can teach animals very basic concepts like if I do this, I get a treat, or if I do that, I get scolded. But anything more than this is generally too complex to communicate to them or for them to understand. They cannot be treated the same as humans or to be of the same intellectual understanding as a grown adult human. They're basically perpetual children in that regard because their mentality cannot extend much beyond that of a four-year-old. Secondly, this is inherently a lie. Zoof files own animals. By the laws of the land, that animal in their cage is their legal property. You can't claim you don't treat them as property while you're buying them. Animals being used by zoophiles as property will, unfortunately, come up again later. So that's all I'll say on the matter until that point because it gets gross and I hate it. Specifically, I and other ethical zoos follow what's called Zeta principles. Zeta being the Greek symbol, but also standing for zoophiles engagement for tolerance and acceptance. So if you see that symbol on a furry, that's probably what they're referring to, or they're an ally towards that kind of cause. Therefore making it easier to spot and then avoid them like they're the new pandemic. Hallelujah! And those principles are, bestow upon animals the same kindness one would wish bestowed upon oneself. Consider the well-being of an animal companion as important as one's own. Place the animal's will and well-being ahead of one's desires for sexual gratification. Teach those who seek knowledge about zoophilia and bestiality without promoting it. Discourage the practice of bestiality in the presence of fetish seekers. Censor sexual exploitation of animals for the purpose of financial gain and censor those who practice and promote animal sexual abuse. Every single one of those tenets is gonna be violated in some fashion before the end of this video. Treat it like an I spy game. Have fun. Zoophiles are not the same as bestialists and fetishists who do not follow those principles. So for the context of this video, Sappho is, to my understanding, using zoophile terminology here, similar to how they call themselves zoos. Fetishists, I'm guessing, are non-zoophile identifying animal sexual abusers. Like I mentioned before, someone can commit the act of bestiality without themselves being a zoophile or having any inclinations beyond the initial offense. So perhaps the allegations against former British Prime Minister David Cameron would be an example of this, where he allegedly stuck his genitals in the mouth of a dead pig for the sake of a society initiation to Oxford University. Gross. Since Sappho is also directly referring to the zoo sadism leaks and the care of the wolf situation, we can also infer that she's partially referring to people a part of those leaks as fetishists as well. With regards to bestialists, I believe that refers in part to the physical abuse inflicted on the animal victims. Zoophiles are under the delusion that their animal-human love is mutually reciprocated and completely harmless to those involved. So they want to separate that from the deplorable, purposely physically harmful bestiality of zoo sadists, trying to create a distinction between the act of bestiality and the acts of bestialists. One should note that any actual sexuality would not need to create this distinction, mostly because the partners involved can indicate consent and not have, is this rape or not, even be a part of the question. This is like having to prove that your sexual partner is not being physically abused by pointing out that sadistic murder rapists exist. I admit, maybe if you're being viewed akin to a sadistic murder rapist, you'd want to fix that public perception. But at the same time, maybe you should consider why you're being conflated with sadistic murder rapists. Just a thought. However, regardless of the terminology she uses, Sappho is making broad, generalized statements about those suffering with zoophilia as a whole, which she, as an individual, cannot back up or verify. Sappho doesn't know most zoophiles, so she can't speak on behalf of them. Additionally, since zoophilia is generally understood as a paraphilia, 
that being a mental health issue. That means that those who suffer from it have a compulsive delusion that allows them to rationalize their thoughts as being okay. Because, let's face it, nobody wants to be the villain of their own story. They want to rationalize their behavior so they come out looking like the hero. So any promotion of the notion that zoophilia is totally okay put out by Sappho is inherently going to be viewed as coming from an unreliable narrator on the matter. And that's whether the audience even understands that it is because of it being a paraphilia and not just because of social implications. Hypothetically speaking, I would see my partner or my mate as an equal to myself. Not possible. This manner of abuse actually happens in human relationships too. It's called financial abuse. It's a form of domestic abuse that involves one partner restricting the financial options of the other as a means of control. This can consist of preventing the victim from working, limiting their access to funds, and cutting them off from any joint monetary ownership. This forces the victim into a dependent role because they are not financially sound enough to escape their abuser. They have no money for a new home, they have no job to support themselves, and likely haven't had a job for the duration of the abuse. They feel inadequate and lack confidence because of the emotional abuse that accompanies the financial abuse, and so the victim is trapped in a cycle of dependence. All pets would be considered to be financially and physically dependent on their owners in the same manner. They can't get jobs. They can't support themselves. They can't pay for food or housing. They can't take care of their own physical health. They don't have the mental capacity to function in society. To expect something from a dog, in this case sexual reciprocation, when they are legally incapable of fending for themselves outside of your care and when you are the one providing everything they need to survive is abusive and coercive. You have no means of telling whether the animal would be similarly invested if they were not completely dependent on the person abusing them. Everything would be out of love, care, and affection for their wellness and well-being. It would not be to serve myself and my desires. Yet again, a disingenuous endorsement from Sappho, explaining these, as acknowledged by her, zoophilic feelings in this manner, considering what Sappho has just described here should be the default when taking care of an animal. Everything I do for my dog is out of love and care and affection, and I do it for her well-being and not my own desires. I promise you, if I didn't have to go outside for walkies twice a day, I wouldn't. If she didn't enjoy sitting outside to sunbathe and people watch in the spring and summer, I certainly wouldn't have bought portable work tech so I could go sit outside with her. But she does, so I did. Everyone should take care of any animals under their protection with the well-being of the animal in mind and not their own desires. So of course, when Sappho details this as her means of taking care of her mate, people are generally going to agree that this is how animals should be treated. But while that's where the interaction with everyone else's animals stops, Sappho tries to include sexual interaction as a part of her dog's care, and that's the problem. And a lot of people have issues with the sort of thing which is understandable. I, I, can, I can understand the, the point of view that others have about my views. If it's understandable that people are going to be disgusted when confronted with zoophilia, then why would you put out a video dunking on the haters when your I'm a zoophile video didn't receive positive feedback? I'm not calling it a coming out video. Zoophilia isn't a sexuality. It's not even tangentially comparable to LGBTQA+. Stop damaging the campaigns of acceptance of others as a desperate means of trying to legitimize your sick paraphilia. Get therapy. I also hold extreme reservations that you can actually understand the issues others have with your viewpoint, given that you've already resorted to manipulative tactics to try and color zoophilia in a positive light to your audience. I imagine that if you understood the mindset, you would be able to provide at least one argument that could be moderately convincing to someone with said mindset. If that were the case, you'd probably be smart enough to actually address the fact that zoophilia is psychologically and socially understood as a paraphilia, but of course she's not going to do that because she wants to push the sexuality narrative, and apparently Sappho isn't smart enough to point out that homosexuality was also considered a paraphilia up until a point. Although, again, homosexuality was able to be reassessed because the participants could consent. Additionally, Sappho doesn't at all make any attempts to explain the behavior that zoophiles see, which is so blatantly consent, that they use as a means of justifying their sexual compulsions. Again, consent being such an issue, you would think that would be the first thing they would want to bring up. They don't bring up these behaviors because their own rationalization and craft of reality would then be in danger should anyone acknowledge that this behavior is grooming or coercive. You would also then probably have the capacity for some manner of self-reflection, which would then probably allow you to recognize that your intrusive zoophilic thoughts are not normal and are certainly damaging. But at that point, we wouldn't even be here. The biggest argument, of course, that comes up is about consent and what is that like, right? And they want to compare 
a like apples to oranges. They want to compare a grown adult sexually immature animal to like a toddler, basically, comparing apples to oranges. And in my opinion, it's a bad faith argument. I don't think you can compare a sexually mature animal to a not sexually mature human. I think it's bad faith. Ah, well, in that case, how much of a bad faith argument would you consider it to be for someone to imply that the comparison is generally between the sexual maturity level between the hypothetical dog and toddler, when in truth, it's the level of intellect being compared? As in, a sexually mature dog's level of intellect, understanding, and its capacity to learn is comparable to that of a human toddler. Because that is the actual core of the argument. Gee, it's almost like it was super disingenuous to obscure the nature of what's being compared. See, when Sappho says that sexually mature animals are being compared to non-sexually mature humans, the inclusion of the sexual maturity of each subject implies to the audience that this aspect is what's being compared. The audience understands that someone has to be sexually mature to consent, and since Sappho has already put in your mind that this is presented as a bad faith argument, she's trying to tell your brain that as long as an animal is sexually mature, they should be able to consent. But this ignores that the ability to consent is mature not only based on physical sexual maturity, but also intellectual maturity. A person could be physically sexually developed, but suffer from developmental issues that limits their intellectual maturity to that of a toddler or a young child. Just because they are physically developed, it doesn't change the fact that they cannot understand concepts like consent, rape, or sex. Therefore, anyone who took advantage of this hypothetical person, regardless as to whether they claim the person wanted it, based on their hormonally induced, clearly not understood humping motions, that would be sexual abuse. This same logic applies to animals. Even if Sappho wanted to argue that it shouldn't be comparable because sexually mature animals are hormonal or whatever, so they clearly want sex at some point, they're still not intellectually adept enough to understand the consequences of screwing the person who feeds and houses them, much less the physical and medical issues to arise from such an act. Sappho, being a human and intellectually more developed than a dog, we can assume, has the capacity to be aware of this and most likely is very much aware of this. The fact that she is trying to reframe this argument as a means of making zoophiles look to be in the right demonstrates that she has manipulative capabilities far exceeding that of the animal she wants to be preying on. Rather than try to argue this issue as people have it, Sappho would rather create a straw man argument for her to face off against instead. It's almost like you're attempting to make your stance seem more palatable by comparing it to that which we all fucking hate, pedophilia, which is hilarious given the correlations between that and zoophilia, and implying that the hypothetical sexual maturity of the animal is the issue at hand with regards to whether humans fucking animals is okay. I promise you, it's not. B both in the sense that this is not the issue and that it's not okay for humans to fuck animals. Should go without saying, but you know, here we are. But back to that hypothetical, and my view on it is that if my mate came up to me loved me and wanted something more in that moment, why would I deny them that need? I want to care for their well-being and help them feel good. At the same time, if the animal is uncomfortable or walks away, that's a no. That's a do not continue. Let's say I do not consent. So remember when I said that Sappho doesn't bother to tell us what those supposedly obviously sexually reciprocal behaviors are? Now, I must also remind you guys that according to Sappho, she doesn't currently have a German Shepherd. So how she's able to confidently predict how her hypothetical German Shepherd would sexually entice her is questionable. That's like predicting exactly how your future fiance is going to get your jollies off. How could a person possibly know that? unless you had really specific taste and you preemptively told them, which obviously Sappho would not be able to do with a dog. If animals are individualistic enough to be considered legally mature adults by zoophilic standards, why is their general sexual behavior so predictable? Would each individual not therein have individual means of engaging sexually? Like, my dog, Demona, has personality traits that make her distinct from other dogs, and I had no means of predicting that personality before adopting her. Our sadly now past family family dog, Gizmo, was a haughty, picky, angry old man who barked his head off, hated everyone, hated getting dirty, had strange temper triggers like slow motion high fives, and thought himself more of a human than a dog. 
Then Demona comes around and she devours chicken hearts, rolling around in dead things, loves meeting new people, and climbs up on your chest in the morning like a baby so she can lick up your nose and eat your brain. You then expect me to believe that this sexual behavior that Zoo Files expound about is so universal that it can be accurately predicted in dogs by people who have never met them? So their personality doesn't come into play at all in that regard? Or are we to believe that Sappho garnered this information from other Zoo Files who were with German Shepherds or other dogs? So those dogs happen to exhibit the same behavior Sappho could then expect from her hypothetical mate? <clears throat> that doesn't strike you as odd that every one of these animals behaves the same, despite the fact that they're supposed to be unique individuals with the capacity for romance? Almost sounds like it's trained behavior, doesn't it? She won't tell us what the reciprocal behaviors are, how convenient, but she'll mention the non-reciprocal behavior that everybody already knows because we're not fucking stupid. I have a really close zoo friend that can explain more in a non-hypothetical way in the second half of this video. And this friend has a female German Shepherd mate and considers her to be the love of his life. Non-hypothetical? And why am I like this? Well, we can speculate on that. I have always loved animals in this kind of way. Even back when I was 11, that would probably be the earliest that I remember, I always found comfort and love in animals. I would lie down with them for hours, sleep cuddled up with them, and never treat myself as any better. My two golden retrievers at the time were my place of safety and comfort. And no, I did not do anything sexual with them. It was something that later on I had always thought about, but I was so ashamed for so long about being the way that I am. It caused a lot of mental pain and turmoil. Which is an odd thing for you to admit, given that when you spoke to the user Coyote Lovely, and I saw this on Twitter, you indicated that whilst seeing a therapist, they claimed that your condition would not be classified as a paraphilic disorder because it doesn't negatively affect or put stressors on your life. Now you're admitting it totally did do just that. So we should be concerned that it's a paraphilic disorder. Granted, I don't really believe Sappho when she details her experiences with the therapist. She has already lied within this video. I really don't have reason to trust that she's gonna relay her therapist's assessment with any sort of genuine accuracy. That's even assuming she's really seeing a therapist or has even detailed this to this hypothetical therapist. Even just the fact that she's made this video and the actions she would take afterwards indicates that she presently has no incentive to overcome these compulsions, in which case therapy isn't gonna help as much as you'd expect it to. Sappho has to actually recognize that it's wrong to screw animals before a therapist would really be able to help her. But she's currently too embroiled in an online zoo file hug box where they can just keep telling each other they're valid. And yes, but recently after discovering there's other people with similar feelings to me and ideals, it has inspired me enough to have this message. And that would include online resources like the Zoo Year Than Now podcast and some other people that I've met through some internet forums. See? Zoophile hug box. Why get help when people online will help you feed your urge and validate those destructive tendencies? Is to educate people about what it means specifically to be a zoophile and that there are shades of gray, not this black and white evil nonsense. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that still sort of counts if you assault an animal. You got horrible urges? Sucks, but go get help. You act on those horrible urges and sexually assault a helpless animal? Terrible. Horrible. Go directly to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Comparing someone like me to a freak that forces themselves onto animals and commits horrendous animal abuse. Yeah, she's just someone who plans to commit horrendous animal abuse when she gets her hands on the right breed of dog. Begs the question, can zoophiles actually have animals they don't fuck? Can they care for animals exclusively as dependents without sexually abusing them? Or does every animal under a zoophile's roof have to be one they can diddle? Questions for another life because I'm too tired in this one. This is to have a personal conversation with my community, furries, zoophiles, and others, and I'm more than happy to answer questions or be interviewed in a neutral manner. No one wants to give you a platform so you can wax poetic about raping dogs, you stupid bitch. She probably takes that as a compliment being called a bitch. With that out of the way, I'm going to switch to more of a podcast style video. Just gonna start recording and cool. So it's really good to have you here. It's good to be talking again. And it's my honor to be your guest. Awesome, cool. So this isn't going to be like a super formal thing, just more of a casual conversation for the people that might be curious watching the video. Um, oh yeah, just like all those other casual conversations one has about fucking dogs. People that might be a little more curious about seeing who, somebody who uh, is zoo exclusive, um, someone who themselves is a zoophile and practices it. You can't practice zoophilia. Zoophilia is the condition. That's like saying I practice anxiety. I'll come back to this after, uh, fuck, this guy needs a name. Zoom.
I'll come back to this after Zoom has detailed his relationship with his mate. Uh, where I would consider myself a zoophile, but, you know, at the moment, that's not really something that I'm doing. So, just for the record, we are both zoophiles. And, um, you're my closest zoo friend and really helped me accept myself. And in fact, you made a post on Zooville, um, and in that particular post, it was about you coming out about things, and you linked uh, an episode of the Zoo Year Than Now podcast about coming out. And that just really inspired me to make this video and to, like, go forward with being more open about it. So, many comments on that. Oh, I'm just really glad to hear that, and it's, it's always a risk putting yourself out there telling your story, and my hope has been to help others find acceptance so that they don't wander through the seemingly endless darkness of denial and repression that so many of us have experienced, and it just makes me sad that some people will never see the end of that, and uh, I'm overwhelmed with joy in your case that you, I was able to directly help you in that way. Absolutely. And uh, I, <clears throat> yeah, it's exceeded my, exceeded my hopes for making that particular post. Absolutely. I went through a whole lot of mental pains, really just refusing to accept who I was for the longest time, and I mean, I would go through some hard periods going through my teens where I would be really into it and know and accept myself like, yes, I am a zoophile, but there weren't those kinds of resources that really talked about it in an open way and um, really broke that perception that the mainstream has about zoophilia. So every time that I would kind of come around to it, I would feel so ashamed and alone that I would just lock all of that in and really just curl up into a ball, really. And I know that you kind of went through a similar experience um, coming out and you also had a struggle to come to accepting yourself. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I certainly relate to wanting to curl into a ball and just hide away from all the ugliness that the internet, you know, that comes up on the internet when you search for any sort of these things. And uh... Ironically, everyone else, as in everyone not suffering from the compulsions of this particular paraphilia, wants to curl up into a ball and hide away from the world when they see the content these guys are comforted by. That's definitely been a big struggle of mine, having those feelings and those thoughts over the course of my whole life and not having any person I felt like I could talk to about or would even beyond just understand and accept, but be able to actually relate to. Probably because when you had the discussion about the birds and the bees, you were the only one taking it literally. Don't fuck the bees! Don't fuck bees! No, the bees! And uh, I struggled to find myself for many years and struggled with my identity as a result of that. And it sort of all fell in place when I just removed myself from society. I turned off my phone, I went hiked up the mountain. And I just wrote it all out and admitted it all to myself first. And I looked at it, my whole history with these feelings and these thoughts, and I just said, okay, I accept this. And that was when my world changed. Uh, Anyone else think it's really obvious and hilarious that a zoophile found themselves by hiking out of a city where you would find lots of humans and into the mountains where you would find a lot of not humans and out there came to the acceptance that he was a zoophile. I don't know, it just seems really obvious and hilarious to me. My mate came along not too long after that and- Translation, I bought a dog. I found this community and found the Zoo Year Than Now podcast and it's, I'm not gonna say that everything's perfect, that I feel 100% okay. It's still, it's still a daily work in progress, but it's so much easier to just be at a point where I'm okay. Absolutely. And I can look myself in the mirror and, and say it. You know, I'm a zoo and my partner is the love of my life. And you know, we're, I love her romantically, physically, you know, that's, that is okay. How do you love a dog romantically? Do dogs have a sense of romance? Does she get all giddy when you litter the bed with roses? Or is she more the gal to like it when you roll in something dead beforehand? Why would a dog even need romance? They're instinctually driven towards sexual activity. It's driven by their hormones compelling them to mate when they're in heat. So what good is romance going to do? If a zoophile moose fucker digs a pit and rolls in moose piss so the smell makes the females ovulate, does that count as romance? You're achieving sexual arousal after all. Do you spit out your doula and foam at the mouth to entice the camel ladies? What about lathering someone up with horse pheromones to get a male to mount them? Or does that not count because you're taking advantage of the animal's basic sexual instincts to manipulate them into sexing you? Romance is like dry mental foreplay and dogs don't have enough mental for you to play with. I think so too. And Absolutely nobody is shocked that two people suffering from the same delusion agree with each other and use this mutual support to convince one another that they're not suffering from said delusion because it's normal. Folie à deux. Or, I guess, folie à communauté. You know, it's, it's really amazing to hear how you overcame that struggle and came to that realization and came to accept yourself for who you are. Is it? Because he kind of just said that he went camping, said it aloud, and listened to a zoophile podcast that encouraged zoophiles coming out. <laughs> like, I, I don't mean to sound flippant. Actually, I do. Yeah, I fail to see what's amazing about that. It sort of just sounds like he heard an opinion that bolstered him into being more openly vocal about his zoophilic inclinations online, spurred on by the notion that, regardless as to how the world reacts, there's a community of people online ready to support or accept him. It's been mentioned 
before, but we'll also be coming back to that podcast, so keep it in mind, I guess. And would you say that you've had to make some sacrifices along the way? All the victims involved in his sexual awakening, maybe? Certainly. Um, sacrifice, that might be a bit of a strong word, at least so far. There's been awkward, awkward moments where, you know, like, uh, my mom in particular, as any good parent does, just wants to see their kid find someone, be happy, and, you know, she set me up with someone to go on a date with, and, you know, I liked her, but I didn't, but I had these mixed feelings, and I wanted to be polite, but I didn't, you know, it was just, <laughs> it was really awkward, and so that's what led me to finally come out and say, look, I have someone, and I'm happy. Yes, she has four legs, but just to hopefully avoid those kinds of things in the future where, you know, someone else's feelings might be at stake. Yeah, and to really curb those perceptions, um, you see your mate as, like, the love of your life, yeah. That's gonna be disconcerting not only for the reasons you'd expect, but also for reasons that kind of directly go against Sappho's whole thing, so... Be excited! And, well, what do you both do together for, like, fun and play, and, like, what, what's that like? How, how does that work? Well, I basically, spending time with her is my number one priority, and it's, I wish I could, if I could, I would just spend 100% of my time with her, I'd never work, because <laughs> it's just so much fun, and so, I take pleasure in simple things, you know, a walk in the woods, I could do that all day, I love it, and she enjoys those things as well, and just- Wow! A dog has simple interests? Almost like they're only capable of understanding simple concepts? <laughs> Like, are we supposed to be shocked that a dog doesn't have a whole lot of interest in playing video games or analyzing literature? Fucking hell! I try to spend at least a couple hours just being active outdoors with her every day. And I just take pleasure in watching her enjoy herself, even if it's, if it's with another person or with another dog or with me or by herself. Um. Weird that he'd feel the need to specify this, given that, and I apologize for the terminology I'm going to use here, most people shouldn't have an issue with seeing their significant other enjoying themselves with other people. Like, what if I said, yeah, I hate my wife hanging out with her friends? Although, that does beg the question, are there zoophiles who get jealous when they see the animal they're abusing engaging with other animals? I'm just gonna assume it's a case-by-case -case basis, because otherwise, were we going off of Sappho's resources, I would then be under the assumption that zoophiles generally like to pass around their animals to other zoophiles to abuse like they're trading Pokemon cards. Yeah. We'll get to that. So that's a bit of a snapshot of our daily routine. I'm fortunate to live in an area where um, exercising her is possible, and I've put myself in a position where I could give her what I imagine to be the best possible life for her that I could provide. And 100% just clarifying for people, the vast majority of the time that you spend with your mate, it's not like sexual or sexualized, it's just being like a good couple, doing normal things. Absolutely. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, and, and it's it's too early in her life to do those sorts of things really in, to that full extent yet, so... Wait, 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 wait. So you haven't had sex with the dog. Okay, uh, firstly, really glad to hear that. Uh, someone go save that poor fucking animal before he harms her. Secondly, how do you then know that your dog seeks to engage with you sexually if not only have you never done it, but she's not even of age? Furthermore, how do you know that your dog is even attracted to humans? Like, animal attraction isn't common in humans, but what, you think human attraction is common enough in animals that any random German shepherd you pick up from the pound will definitely want to screw you? What, because they see you as a member of the pack? So you admit they're not intellectually adept enough to recognize the differences between a human and a dog. Seems rather presumptuous. Seems like a lot of work to put into something that won't end up giving you what you want at the end of the day, but which you're supposed to take care of for the rest of its life. Weirdly, I have reservations about a zoophile just like accepting that and being totally fine with it, as well as the insulting level of stupid coincidence it would require for human attraction to be common enough in dogs that that is a thing. Like, yes, animals screwing animals of other species does happen, but it's equally rare and quite often just rape. So again, what would be the odds that you just happened to pick a dog that you happen to be attracted to, who also happens to have a paraphilia similar to yours where it's attracted to those outside of its own species and its attraction just happens to be humans? Are you kidding me? What if they're attracted to salamanders and the only reason they tolerate you is because you're tiny any slimy, splotchy dick reminds them of one. Thirdly, uh, so grooming. You know, where you take a living creature and raise it under your specific guidance and teachings to sexual age so that you can fuck it. Because remember, they said that dogs mature around age one and a half or two. So this dog hasn't even reached sexual maturity, it can't be more than two years old, and yet this guy is calling her his mate. What was that you said earlier, Sappho, about someone taking advantage of a dog before it's sexually mature is being seen as the equivalent of pedophilia in 
in your community. Oh, but I guess it's totally okay to treat that sexually immature dog like it's your mate and that it has already accepted the condition of future consent with you. It's okay to assume a sexually immature dog will fuck you one day, huh? Imagine if a... Oh, uh, let's see, two years and seven per, and this guy's at least gotta be mid 20 so. Okay, imagine a 100-year-old man adopting a developmentally disabled baby girl, calling her his wife, providing for all of her financial, medical, and other needs, and then, after he raises her to 14, he starts sexually abusing her. Actually, no, I guess this is more a, uh, when she turns 14, he assumes she'll fuck him because that's the age equivalent and logic we're working with here. As long as you wait around for them to become sexually mature, tending to all the animal's needs, building a bond with it, and providing the very food it needs to survive, that's not predatory at all. Plus, let's not forget that since animals are legally treated as property, this idiot literally had to buy his soulmate, either from a breeder or a shelter. I'm sorry, but in what situation would that ever be remotely acceptable? Purchasing a significant other? What is this, a shitty tween romance webtoon? If he went to a breeder, he'd be purchasing her specifically for her breed, with no indication that she's sexually interested in humans in the slightest. The only way one could know that is if the animal was bred or specifically trained for human sexual gratification, or else was an animal that already showed signs of sexual aggression or prior sexual sexual abuse. That's sexual slavery! You're literally buying an animal with the intent of having sex with it as soon as you conceivably can, and because of the nature of this thought process being a paraphilia, you somehow manage to convince yourself like this isn't entirely motivated by your own sexual compulsions. You know, and that's another part of being, being zoo exclusive is it's an individual adventure. It's not like we have all these role models around us say this is what's right, this is what's wrong. Ah, well, you do. You're just not listening to them because they're telling you it's wrong to sexually take take advantage of animals. It's, there is obviously, you can tell consent, yes or no, if you can read basic body language, but it's still an individual adventure, and you get to know your partner, and you get to know yourself, and I'm still learning a lot. Neither Sappho nor Zoom have made an effort to explain what this basic body language that makes it so obvious animals want to fuck them is. As long as I don't use specifics, nobody can tell me I'm wrong. That's very true, and so kind of going off on that leg about, you know, you can tell when they're consensual and such, uh, a lot of people struggle with that because, you know, they, they don't understand how dogs mature and how zoophiles don't go after, like, puppies and small dogs and stuff. Honey, I promise you, it's not the size of the dog that matters. We know most of you guys only go after large breed dogs, not because of attraction, but because the larger size of the animal means that the area of sexual objectification is also larger, and therein there's more to work with. Like, if it was just about romance and didn't have to be centered on sexual gratification, there shouldn't be a problem with a zoophile going after a small dog, right? Because they only have the animal's best interest in mind, right? So of course, they would never engage with an animal that was too small for them. But now you're specifying that you only go after large breed dogs. Is that because a large breed dog suffers less visibly physical damage from sex with a human, so you have an easier time justifying it? Despite the fact that the small breed could be sexually mature, which is what the issue was beforehand. Now it's sexual maturity and the size of the dog. Hmm. They, they just want to perceive us as like evil people who, you know, if we get close to right. a dog. Yeah, it's like, when we see your dog walking down the street, we're not thinking, oh wow, I want to tap that. Like, that's not how it is. And, <laughs> well, we can't speak for all of us. Well, Zoom totally knows someone who did that. I can't speak for all Zoom files, yeah, but... Oh, but you did do that earlier, didn't you, Sappho? Well, I guess I can't say it was earlier because I assume it was recorded after this interview with Zoom, but it was contained earlier in this video, so either way, it just looks like a big old contradiction on your part. Earlier, you claimed that there was a group of people who were not real zoophiles, that they were fetishists and bestialists, that they did not belong in the zoophile community, and that real zoos don't act like they do. In a new classification of zoophilia published in the Journal of Forensic and Legal Medicine in February 2011, Anil Agrawal identifies multiple variations of zoophiles. Human animal role players, romantic zoophiles, zoophilic fantasizers, tactile zoophiles, fetishistic zoophiles, sadistic bestials, opportunistic zoophiles, regular zoophiles, and exclusive zoophiles. Regular fantasizing and romantic zoophiles being the most common, and with sadistic bestials and opportunistic zoophiles being the least. Apparently, the exclusive desire for animal sexual partners is also considered a rare condition of
of the paraphilia, and those afflicted often suffer with more than one. Which, yeah, it, it's actually quite common. Paraphilias rarely come as solo acts. If a person suffers from one paraphilia, chances are they suffer from multiple. So, you might not like zoo sadists, particularly because they give you a bad general image, but they are classified as zoophiles. They just happen to be on the extreme end of that classification. Plus, I feel like it should go without saying that they probably also have some other paraphilic compulsions mixed in to get to that point, like sexual sadism, necrophilia, or pedophilia. I mean, she offhandedly mentioned the zoo sadism leaks, and we know a bunch of people from that leak were also implicated in abusing children and necrophilia specifically, leaving us with some handy examples of this pattern. So you can't speak for all zoo files, but you did. And you did it during the point of your video where you were specifically trying to paint zoo files in a positive light to your, assumedly to you, impressionable audience. Well golly gee, that just seems a little manipulative there, don't you know? What's actually more hilarious is that one of Sappho's sources, the ones she's using to promote the good side of zoophilia, yeah. One of the guys from there stole people's dogs and horses specifically so he could fuck them. So she's promoting the word of this self-professed zoophile who did the very thing that these two idiots are saying zoophiles don't do. And he stole the animals to then do it? Is that right? Oh yeah, and don't worry, we'll go over him in a bit. Because <laughs> I know for me, it's, it's definitely like that. And it's, if you're going to be with a dog that is not sexually mature, which is at least like a year and a half, two years old for a lot of breeds, it's like, a lot of us consider that like pedophilia in a way. Um, if you're doing like intercourse and such, that's that's just how it is. So I, I really want to clarify that for the people watching this video that, you know, there are ethical guidelines that people follow. Provided you just pretend like grooming isn't a thing. Right, absolutely. I mean, it's, it is primarily about having that emotional bond. And that's what I've learned through having uh, at least one really meaningful, non-sexual romantic attraction to another dog who has belonged to a friend of mine. And that's what really taught me who I am, I would say, was that I could find that love and that bond without the physical aspect of sex. Okay, oh, okay, never mind. Zoom was the one attracted to his friend's dog. The exact thing you said people didn't have to worry about with zoo files. Don't know why I tried to joke like it was his friend. I think we all fucking knew the minute he interjected. And another thing to know, um, also going along with that kind of romantic but not sexual relationship that you had with your friend's dog, um, I just want to clarify and really uh, help people understand that this isn't about one's personal desires for, you know, sexual gratification or... It's completely about that. Anything like that, but it's pretty much purely about caring about the well-being of your mate, of the animals that you love, and it's not about controlling them or forcing them to do sexual acts. You can care for the well-being of an animal without having sex with it. If it really was about the well-being of the animals, then the fact that you can't fuck them wouldn't be an issue. If it was for the well-being of the animal, then why would any zoophile sexually engage with their animals if they knew it could get the animal taken away. Knowing this, to do otherwise would be completely selfish. You are choosing to engage with the animal in a way that you are aware is illegal and which could result in the animal being put in a shelter, consequences which the animal is wholly unaware of, meaning it isn't informed consent. It's not necessary, so any instance where you blatantly break the law by engaging with your animal is you taking advantage of their ignorance about the situation to do something that you don't really even need to do to them. Like the dog isn't gonna fucking die if you don't wank it off. There would be no reason to push so hard for having sex with animals if your main goal wasn't to have sex with animals. None of these guys are out here arguing for an animal's right to own property, or their right to vote, or their right to a fair trial, or anything of the like. They're arguing against spaying and neutering. It keeps coming back to sex because it's about sex. Right, it's the beauty, a true zoo will know it's the beauty of that mutual bond that you find with one another when you're able to communicate on a two-way street. Ah uh, yes, the no true zoo file fallacy. Exactly, and, and there's gonna be a whole bunch of resources in the description for people who are interested and really want to dig in and kind of understand this stuff, but... Ah, finally! We get to her sources! Sit back, pour yourselves a fresh cup of tea, and guzzle down another donut or some popcorn because this is gonna be a long interjection. Okay, to start things off, she's only got three resource links for us, and they're all direct links to Zoophile run content. Actually, no, she did have three. It's five now. I think she changed it up in the description at some point while I was writing this, or I just missed some. Who cares? None of these are studies or academic pieces to support any of the claims she's made. Nothing to prove that zoophiles are somehow better at taking care of animals. Nothing to demonstrate how 
exactly animals can scent. In fact, they link to zookommunity.org, Zeta Verande, which sounds like a Numa Numa lyric but for dog diddling, and the before mentioned coming out episode of the Zooier Than Thou podcast. To start things off, zookommunity.org. This is a forum for zoo files, plain and simple. You're not exactly going to get unbiased peer-reviewed statistics on the objective behaviors, patterns, or traits of zoophilia, or anything to actually prove this narrative of it being a sexuality. I took a quick glance at the site, much to the chagrin of my disturbingly intrigued FBI monitor. While there are seemingly sections of the site geared towards information, health, and research, again, these are just forum posts and can ultimately be posted and replied to by anyone with an account. The categories are for the discretion of the poster to use, and sometimes they will make an attempt to start a conversation, but because basically everyone here is biased towards the notion that zoophilia is totally okay, the conversations don't go anywhere and don't delve into the subject with any real depth or self-awareness. None of these idiots are arguing under the assumption that zoophilia maybe couldn't be a sexuality or maybe could be detrimental. They all just argue in favor of it with their own personal variations. They argue from the predetermined stance that their assumptions are correct, and therein any information that might contradict that notion isn't even considered, working backwards in an effort to find evidence to support their narrative, rather than coming to a conclusion based on the information gathered through research and study. So it's just a biased hug box. There's no real means of verifying if anything they offer is actually truthful, since we've already seen that Sappho, the person attempting to present the zoophile community as trusting and kind and truthful, is completely willing to obscure and lie about aspects of zoophilia and her situation to serve her narrative. There are instances where a paper is linked and the forum discussion to follow is just them disagreeing with anything that speaks negatively towards zoophilia, but then agreeing with anything that could potentially be read positively. No fucking shock there. Of course all you hear is praise when they come across a piece of media that potentially paints bestiality in a sympathetic light, but if that same paper implies that bestiality is bad for the animal, all of a sudden they take issue with it. Again, no fucking shock. It's almost like people suffering from a delusion can't readily be objective about said delusion. Man, I've known people like this. Oh, you're the smartest person I know when it's a situation where they're in hot shit and they want my help. Oh, but anytime I disagree with them, I'm wrong and they gotta put up the big defensive tough routine. I hate people like this. They will argue things that are seemingly understood and documented scientific phenomenon and their response usually has something to do with, well, actually, they like sex because I said so and you have to believe me, so there. Seriously, when linking a lecture from Professor Professor Keith Kendrick, the poster quoted, This lecture will consider different patterns of male and female sexual behaviors, how hormones act to control them, and how and why the rigid link between sex and reproduction has been relaxed during evolution to include maintenance of social relationships. We will also consider whether other animals have problems with impotence and if diversity in sexual orientation is unique to humans. To which the response from the next poster is, Of course! Well, I think they derive sexual pleasure! Yeah, zoophile, we know that you you think they like it, but you ain't exactly a reliable source. Oh, and I want to point out that I feel like this lecture was only something they brought up because it speculated about the evolutionary relaxing of the role of sex as exclusively a means of procreation. Why? I don't know. Maybe because it fits directly into their narrative of zoophiles who put forward the idea that they can diddle animals outside of their typical hormonal and mating cycles. Because it's not just for procreation, it's for pleasure, and the animals collect really like it. And once again, if it's not about sex, then why do so many of these forum posts have to do with sex and justifying the act of bestiality? Like, they're often unwilling to accept that zoophilia is a paraphilia and not a sexual orientation, but then will also acknowledge that some zoophiles become zoophiles because they were sexually abused, sometimes by an animal when they were a child. You know, early childhood sexual abuse, that thing that tends to cause long-lasting mental health issues later in life that the person may not even be aware of. Oh, but nah, couldn't be zoophilia. That's the mental health issue caused by that trauma. That'd be crazy. Considering this forum is advertised as being for zoophiles and zoophile allies, Sappho would have no reason to cite it as a resource unless it was for people to join. I'm assuming either as the allies Sappho expected to win over or other zoophiles, because otherwise there's nothing in there that would even remotely prove her claims. Also, I think we're far enough into the video that I can point this out. Uh, you want to know what the definition of promote is? Promote is defined as to further the progress of something, especially a cause, venture, or aim, 
support, or actively encourage. What do you think Sappho is doing by linking the site and trying to accrue allies and support for her quote unquote coming out. What do you think she's doing by making this video and, as there have been whisperings and later confirmations of her attempts, creating an organization to argue for zoophilic sexual rights? Promoting zoophilia. Specifically, Sappho is attempting to further her self-imposed cause of attaining zoosexuality rights. She supports the notion that zoophilia is okay and encourages the acceptance of sexual relationships, otherwise known as bestiality, between human and zoophiles and their pets. No, I don't care that she calls them mates. Claiming zoosexuality as her means of trying to garner support under the guise of being marginalized in ways similar to the LGBTQA community, by putting that out in the world in the form of this very video, with her acknowledged goal of trying to get people to understand her side, she's promoting it. What was the fourth Zeta principle that one teaches those who seek knowledge about zoophilia and bestiality without promoting them, and instead your response is to directly try to get people to become zoophile allies and you link them to a zoophile forum to pull them into the community. Seriously? And these are super direct and obvious means of promoting it too, which is why it's so baffling to then have Sappho be all, yeah, promoting it is totally something we're all against. Well, actually, it's not that baffling. She's just a delusional fucking liar. Like, to be fair, the minute I heard that principle, I knew it was gonna get violated before this video's end. The only way one would be able to address zoophilia without promoting it would be to come at the subject from like an unbiased clinical point of view, which basically all of these idiots have proven they can't do because they're completely embroiled in their paraphilic delusions. Sappho basically violated the principle before she even stated that there were principles that she was trying not to violate. Brilliant! All right, next one. Zeta Verinde. We've got three links for this one, all of which are basically just as useless as the one that came before it, all of which Sappho, for some reason, believes is informative. The first links to seemingly what should be a general definition of what zoophilia is for the uninformed. Much like basically all of Sappho's links, it's written by a zoophile and colors zoophilia in a more positive, less clinically critical light. As well as being as vague as possible when discussing how zoophilia is viewed in the wider scientific community. At this point, I'm going to be getting free psychiatric care from all the fucking shocks I'm being treated to. Unsurprisingly, they don't adequately represent the scientific consensus on zoophilia. Maybe this is where Sappho learned all of her tricks from. What is zoophilia? On the question of the definition of zoophilia, there are two slightly different answers. First, the science and the public in general, and on the other, the zoophiles itself. In science, zoophilia is commonly defined as sexual attraction for animals. That is, affected animals feel, or one or more specific species, as sexually attractive as normal people are just basically to persons of the opposite or the same sex, or both sexes are drawn. Conversely, this of course does not mean that zoophilia automatically may find animal attractive that comes to them under the eyes. What? As with hetero and homosexuality, countless factors also play a role here, for example, gender, appearance, and character. Zoophilia does not necessarily involve sexual acts, but the desire to do so is usually pronounced, so that the bong, this tendency is obvious. I think that was a mistranslation error. <laughs> there are zoophiles that can fall in love animals and this view and treat them as life companions. In other countries, sexuality in the foreground and less emotional attachment, and for still others, the general proximity to animals, merely a preference, the only secondary or even unconsciously acts of sexual satisfaction. Wow, the translation of this page is garbage. No! In science, zoophilia is commonly defined as a paraphilia or psychiatric disorder recognized by a persistent sexual interest in animals. The classification of it being a mental disorder is important, and one which this definition conveniently leaves out. Since Sappho cites these resources with no additional input or context on her end, I'm going to assume that this is because she believes these links and the information provided herein speaks for itself. So in that vein, let me just go over why all of this is crap. Now, one thing I need to make note of is that the person who wrote all of this seems to originally be from Germany, and so when discussing the issue at hand, they mostly cite German law. I won't be going into any laws specifically, as it basically just talks about animal care, welfare, and abuse laws, much like some laws the American zoophile 
files might cite, so we won't need to go into any semantics about laws between countries or whatever. Just assume, for the sake of hypotheticals, that most places have animal abuse laws that are relatively similar to one another, though ultimately lacking in some necessary protections. I'll also read it out myself because I don't want to have to subject my friends to what's about to be said here, so enjoy my impression of a German zoo file, I guess. I've been putting this off for months because I have absolutely no confidence in my ability to fake a German accent, but the video I watched on how to fake a German accent said to do all the things that I was going to do anyways, so whatever, we'll go ahead, we'll see how it goes. The case against general criminaliz criminalization that's hard to say with a German accent. The case against general criminalization. Abusing animals, including sexual abuse, is already illegal in Germany. Animals are protected by the German Animal Protection Law, 17 T blah 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 letters, German Animal Welfare Act, which addresses all animal abuse regardless of the motivation. As soon as the animal is harmed, these laws are applicable even today. His harm comprises not not only corporal suffering, but also psychological harm, development of behavioral disorders like apathy, anxiousness, aggressiveness, etc. It is therefore not only illegal to excessively lash or otherwise manhandle the creature, but also to psychologically abuse it such that it develops disorders. So here's the acknowledgement that physical and psychological abuse causes mental disorders, even in animals. Good. Glad to know we all agree on that. Problem, however, uh, they state that animal abuse laws already exist as though it is being argued that more laws against the abuse of animals should be put into place, and for some reason the zoo files, whom Sappho has indicated to us are supposed to be the most loving and capable caregivers for animals, apparently have a problem with that. Considering this is supposed to be their argument as to why their actions shouldn't be criminalized, my guess? Those proposed additional laws specifically had to do with sexual abuse. It is plain wrong to equate zoophilia or even the whole zoo sexuality with the sexual abuse of animals. Oh gee, how did I know? Sex does not imply harm. Nature evolves the sexual drive of mammals such that male as well as female adult mammals in general enjoy the consensual act. Mammals, huh? As in like all mammals? Collectively, we all just managed to evolve to enjoy sex in the exact same way across all species. So elephants and rats enjoy sex the same way that sloths and sea cows do? Fuck off. Mammal is such a broad term that it basically applies to most living creatures with warm blood and hair. Who wants to bet that I can find animals who probably don't think that sex is that great? I mean, cats seem like an obvious choice. You ever hear a female cat having sex? I don't know, I'm not a zoophile, but I feel pretty confident in my ability to tell you that pussy ain't having a great time. Female ducks have literally evolved maize vaginas because gang rape is such a prevalent part of duck mating, but I don't see zoophile duck fuckers out here sporting a corkscrew penis. Actually, birds in general, because Adelie penguins will fuck anything with or without a pulse. Or are we exclusively talking about mammals here? Because let's see, uh, male giraffes taste female urine to see if their mate is fertile. I don't know how many zoophiles do that. Male hippos attract mates by flinging around their fecal matter. The brown anted shyness breaks down its own muscles to provide the energy it needs to speed fuck its mate in a sex session that lasts up to 14 hours all while the mouse is bleeding internally. They die after this. It's called suicidal reproduction. Some rat fucker out there just got really hard and I bet I know his name. Female hyenas have a pseudo penis for a clitoris, so when they mate, the two dicks basically kiss in the sense that they turn into Michael Rooker from Slither. I'm guessing no zoophile is actively engaging in these particular sex rituals. Almost like they weren't, um, oh, what's the word? Evolved for it. Weird. Admittedly, dolphins are like a zoophile's wet dream because they have been known to peruse outside of their species, by which I mean they've been known to rape dolphins and non-dolphins, including humans. And that isn't to say that sex can't play a major role in the lives of mammals. Bonobos are an excellent example of that, since sex is intimately ingrained into their social bonding rituals to the point where something like 75% of the sex they engage in is non-reproductive in nature. 
but we aren't fucking bonobos, and you certainly shouldn't be fucking bonobos. You practically want to take the sexual social structure of one creature of one species, you, a human, and apply it to a single creature of a completely different species, somehow not thinking there's going to be a lack of crossover? And does this apply to your animal victim? Are they allowed to impose the social sex habits of other animals into your routine? If a dog gets sick of your shit, can they twist their head around all mantis style and bite your dick off? I mean, it's not like you guys discuss what you're going to be doing beforehand, considering you've acknowledged that animals can't understand human language, much less many of the concepts portrayed behind it. Like, even if you actually thought this was a thing, you would never be able to do anything outside of purely vanilla natural sex that one could engage in in the wild, because the hypothetical animal in that situation would have no means of communicating about anything kinkier. Don't you think that, in that regard, maybe some things aren't going to translate? That's why communication is kind of a big deal. That thing that animals can't effectively do. Plus, let's be real, they got pleasure from it so it's fine, is the same thing child molesters say when trying to justify their actions. If the person who received pleasure actually enjoyed it, then they can say for themselves. The assumed victimizer should never be speaking on their victim's behalf. Fucking doy. If your significant other is incapable of communicating to other people the nature of their consent and you're the only person speaking on their behalf while you do whatever the fuck you want, you're an abuser. When they make positive experience, they will try to repeat these. This ensures the endurance of a species. Incidentally, that's also how training works. Do the thing, get a treat, happy animals. Now, in this situation, is it more likely that they're continuing the behavior for the preservation of the species or because you gave them a treat. Considering you're not of the same species and they wouldn't even be aware of that as a possibility, I'm gonna say the latter. Anyhow, humans as well as animals are not permanently happy to mate. If an animal is forced to perform or endure acts of a zoosexual nature, the German Animal Welfare Act, more words I'm not gonna say, is applicable. This law should only apply in cases where it's forced on the animal. Okay, then since animals can't say when it's forced, we should assume it's all forced. No, that interrupts my fun, because I'm their mate and I say it's consensual. Do you acknowledge that rape can occur between a married couple? Yes? Do you acknowledge that a person can be in a romantic relationship with someone and still be sexually abused by them? Yes? Do you acknowledge that victims who are in abusive relationships generally have issues with speaking up? Yes? And somehow that's going to be easier to do if you're an animal who can't communicate with humans, has to be owned and cared for by a human and doesn't know anything about legal options? Go fuck yourself. The cases of forced or violent human-animal intercourse are very isolated. These are cases of zoosadism. You know, you can keep saying that, but sexual abuse is still abuse, and what you do is sexually abuse animals. Zoo files explicitly denounce all and every kind of violence against animals. How is it just to criminalize the complete group of zoosexuals because of a few such individuals in it? Because those individuals rape, torture, and mutilate animals to death. Even if we were to believe this asinine notion that having sex with an intellectually immature, uninformed animal wasn't abusive, it still presents unwilling animals into an abusive community where they can and will be harmed and effectively turned into and used as sex slaves. Like, I'm not sorry about that. You won't die if you can't get a goat to suck your knob. Sexual orientation does not mean that the sex is dominant. Just as with all other sexual orientations, there are zoosexual partners who do not have any or very few intercourse. If they're not having sex with the animal, then there's no issue, you slimy, insufferable faux argument maker. Zoophiles are not outlawed. Abusing animals is. You can't outlaw a mental disorder, you dumb tit. You can identify as a zoophile all you want, as long as you don't abuse animals. People are going to be grossed out by you, and that's a social consequence that you will have to deal with, sure, but you won't be in jail. At least from this, we can see exactly where Sappho appropriated all of her disingenuous arguments. Human-animal intercourse is more than just the penetration of the animal by the human. There are other options, which probably together are the majority of all cases. Penetration of the human by the animal, oral sex by the human on the animal, or vice versa, masturbation. And is that all still counted under sex? 
yes. So would that still count as abuse of an animal? Ask yourself this, if you swap out an animal with a child, is it still sexual abuse? Yes? Then it's still sexual abuse. Interspecies intercourse is not unnatural. Animals which have been bred by mankind since the beginning of time often see a human as a herd slash pack member. The extension to see him as a sexual partner is very small, if at all. Okay, so not only are you acknowledging that some animals have been bred for the sake of human convenience, needs, and operation, you also indicate that they identify people based on packs, which would be determined based on proximity and afforded care. So, basically, you want to specifically prey on a group of animals that has been trained and conditioned over generations to appease humans, bred to conform to our arbitrary shifting standards, creating numerous medical issues within certain breeds, and your defense of this predatory practice is, well, they live with me and I provide their care, so I'm like their only sexual option. So, the exact things that make it predatory are the reasons for why this behavior is supposed to be okay. Oh boy, big brain fucking argument you got there. This domesticated as well as wild animal species intercourse in between species has been observed and is well documented. Teenagers will sexually interact with one another. Still doesn't mean it's appropriate for an adult to be sexual with them. The same thing applies to animals. So again, your point? Like ultimately any arguments these guys would present in favor isn't going to fly because the law inherently recognizes an animal's intellect and world awareness being lesser or, in a small number of specific cases, equal to that of a human child. Aside from them legally being considered property, which, yeah, kind of fucked up, but considering not too long ago people thought that keeping human beings as property was hunky-dory, I'm not exactly surprised we haven't advanced that far in universal animal care. We can't even sort out our own issues without going to war half the time. Interspecies intercourse is not defined as sexual abuse. Why, on the other hand, must it always be so when a human is participating? Because interspecies intercourse is done between non-human animals who are all categorized as being of the same levels of not understanding variable human concepts like rape. Unless you want to argue that certain animals are more mentally adept based on what we've observed in the wild and in captivity, but we know you're not going to argue that because you want any laws allowing you to do what you want to be broad. Why the fuck would the law categorize interspecies intercourse not involving humans as abuse? It doesn't involve humans. The law doesn't apply to the animal kingdom. Rape isn't a thing in the wild. The sea lion fucks the penguin and and then it eats the penguin. It's not privy to the animal abuse laws of the Arctic. There's no time to focus on trauma and legal battles out here. Look, there it goes, back into the ocean. Ah, shoot. Guess you'll just have to contact him through his lawyer. You stupid motherfuckers. The law applies when humans participate because the law applies to humans. It is plain wrong that animals do not have the ability to communicate consent or dissent. It is true that animals do not speak a human language, nor can they fully comprehend one. However, it is fact that animals communicate without words, with each other as well as with humans. Well known are animal sounds, purring, hissing, growling, barking, whimpering, snorting, neighing, body language, facial expressions. In every other case, we accept that humans can interpret animal expressions, e.g. whether they are thirsty, hungry, whether they want to be walked, whether they are tired, whether whether or not they desire to be petted, whether they are anxious at the veterinarians, whether they like having the claws clipped or being injected, whether they fear the slaughtering house, etc. No, we don't trust that humans can do that, mostly because animals all have different motions and indicators for these things, and because humans can't just inherently do that? Like, what the fuck? Like, I've, I've known people who did not know how to read a fucking animal. And I'm not just talking about the idiots who try to take selfies with wild animals while the animal is blatantly showing signs of aggression. I'm talking about knowing people who couldn't even read their own heckin' dog. Our past dog, Gizmo, would growl at you and then sneeze as a confirmation when you would ask if he had to go outside. Just like a low rumbling growl to get noticed. But Demona, quiet as she is, puts her paws up on my chair 
there to get my attention and shakes her head violently as a confirmation instead. These are two vastly different actions between different dogs, but they ended up meaning the same thing. These just happened to be the specific hint motions each of my dogs developed separately to fill in the same gap in communication. Additionally, some dogs will wait beside or howl at the door. Some dogs stare at you with sad, pathetic, pleading eyes. Some will bark, some will whine. Some dogs can get outside on their own. Some dogs won't even wait for you and they'll just pee in the house. And that's just having to go outside. I could give you a list of Demona's behaviors and quirks that, guaranteed, are going to be different from somebody else's dog because, like people, all of those dogs grew up in different environments and thus developed differently. We do not trust that in every other case, humans inherently understand what their animals' needs or wants are. Those are things that people learn or which develop over time as the animal and human bond. And even if that were the case, humans are not obligated to conform to the wants of that pet depending on what they are. So even if the dog doesn't want to go to the vet, that lump on his neck tells his human that he's going anyways. Even if the dog wants to go for a ride in the car, that doesn't change that it's 3 a.m. and she should be sleeping, Demona. That's what the adult humans are for, caring for the animal that isn't capable of doing so on its own and making sensible, informed decisions for their health. That includes veterinary care. That is the task one takes on when they adopt a pet. Like guys, the fact that these zoophiles are constantly referring to animals as a whole, or animals they've never met as all exhibiting the same actions so confidently that they can for sure predict that the animal they personally feel attracted to is always totally gonna bang them, should show you that they are objectifying those animals. Horses and dogs do not act the same. Cats and rats do not act the same. Sure, they could exhibit some similar behaviors under certain circumstances, but those behaviors happen to be signs of abuse, and those circumstances happen to be abuse. These people are not treating their victims as individual animals of a species capable of choice or unique actions, they're reading them as templates. They barely even seem to take species into consideration unless it's with regards to whether the species is large enough that they can fit in it. Also, animal abuse doesn't apply to slaughterhouses, you disingenuous fuck. You want to talk about animal abuse in those facilities? More power to you. Talk about animal abuse in those facilities. They're horrible and the legal loopholes companies go through to perpetuate those terrible, tortuous environments is disgusting. But don't equate it to people trying to take care of their pets. Fuck you. This is the kind of broad, disingenuous argument that makes people hate zoophiles. Because all any sensible person sees is that desperate scramble to victimize a helpless animal. Even going so far as to excuse it because other bad things happen to animals, so why not my schlong? That's like saying, um, human trafficking is a thing, so nobody should actually care if I go after the drunk girl passed out behind the dumpster. Why is communication suddenly completely impossible when it is about sexuality? Do horses count out the number of times they want you to jizz on them? Why should a human be incapable of reading whether or not an animal is ready to mate at the moment or whether it enjoys or merely uneasily suffers sexual acts? What's the dog motion? for, you piece of human trash, you just raped me, take me to the cops right now, I want to file a report, your ass is going to jail. I would also like to point out that this person has questioned why it can't be possible that a human is capable of reading dog behavior so well that they can tell what the dog wants, but that still ignores the possibility that some people can't bridge that communication gap. It's like, yeah, some people are probably inherently good at reading animals, but there's no guarantee that the people who want to screw animals are are the same ones who happen to be good at reading them. Plus, like, what if they just lie? Again, we've seen zoophiles lying about their interactions and their feelings in this very video, so it's not exactly out of the realm of reason. What if a zoophile is good at reading animals, an animal indicates that it's not sexually interested, but the zoophile just goes ahead anyways? Who's gonna figure that out? The normies who apparently can't tell when an animal's in distress? We're just supposed to trust that the person who is inherently 
apparently incentivized to lie for their own sexual gratification is gonna tell the truth when confronted? Sure. We know that every zoophile claims to know how to read animals, and overall they try to claim that zoophiles as a whole are better at reading animals than normies, but we also know a good chunk of them are disingenuous, delusional liars, so really, what's the likelihood that there's a bunch of zoophiles out there that can't effectively read animal behavior, but who have convinced themselves that they can and abuse animals under that pretense? It doesn't matter that there's a weird trend of zoophiles constantly having their animal victims die from conditions that should have otherwise been perfectly treatable, despite the claim that they're supposed to be such amazing caregivers. Just saying, you guys, if someone has multiple animals in their care who have at least decade-long life expectancies, and those animals die under the course of a few years, and they're not fostering older animals, maybe they're not taking great care of those animals. Seriously, I will care for one dog for 15 years. How some of these people go through multiple animals in a decade and unironically think they can promote themselves as better than average caregivers is insulting. The extent of that delusion disgusts me even further because I am then aware of how many animals must be suffering behind it while these people gleefully brag about how much they love and attend to their victims. An animal can have a beneficial sexual partnership with a human. Extraordinary claims, extraordinary evidence. Either show me or shove it. Please recall that we are discussing adult animals. These possess a completely developed sexuality when they want to satisfy. Adult animals are not asexual stuffed toys. Refer to my earlier counter as to it being a matter of the animal's intellectual maturity and their inability to comprehend certain concepts, not sexual maturity that is the issue here. Addressing their sexual needs will reduce their crave to do so. This leads to relaxation, low aggression, and a balanced soul. Souls don't exist or else have no evidence of existence. Speak factual to me. Speak facts to me. That's definitely not the beat. beat. This is why professional trainers use masturbation as a common tool during the training of an animal. I demand heckin' sources for this claim, mostly because I really don't feel like searching up more variations of do dog trainers masturbate their dogs today. The FBI agent that monitors my Google searches and research already thinks that I'm a degenerate. This sounds like such hot bullshit, but if it's so common that you can cite it out of your ass, then I'm sure you can find evidence of it as a practice. Considering that not being shown here, that leads me to believe that you couldn't find evidence, which then makes me think that you're trying to, once again, justify what you want to do to animals. It's like that whole, any animals taken away from loving human sex partners are instantly killed just for the crime of loving us argument these people sometimes tout. It sounds extreme in measure, and that's because it is, because they are exaggerating the truth to make themselves seem right. Often the animal starts the advances. Oh, for fuck's sake! As was mentioned before, many animals which were domesticated throughout history see the human as a herd slash pack member. It is not uncommon that these animals try to woo the human or openly offer matings. But sexuality in public is taboo within our culture. Isn't the guy writing this from Germany? That place where you can have sex in public parks? Also prostitution, brothels, nudist beaches. Like, Germany is what I think of when I think of taboo social sex. And the sexuality of animals is embarrassing for us. Therefore, we act to suppress such acts from the beginning, including castration, to completely get rid of the animal sexuality. Ah uh, yes. Of course. How could I have been so naive? Spaying and neutering animals isn't for the sake of controlling population rates and stopping animals from being born on the streets of a civilization they would have difficulty surviving in without a caregiver. It's because animals going at it gives us the squickies. You know, frequent viewers of my channel might be aware that projection is a thing, in that people project onto the world what they already understand, usually aspects about themselves. If someone looks at animals and all they see has to do with that animal's sex, what do you think they assume other people see when looking at animals? Just saying, it's very interesting to hear zoophiles wax on about how the rest of the world is obsessed with controlling animal sexuality. Not the zoophile, no no. The people suffering from an understood paraphilia that compels them to sexually take advantage of creatures outside of their species. Literally everyone besides them. Can't make this shit up. 
Moreover, as has been stated, there are cases of sexual acts in which the animal plays the active role and the human is passive. Can the animal suffer in this constellation at all when it acts without the human doing anything? For example, when it starts to lick or penetrate on its own. Jesus Christ, look, if you were just out and about doing your own thing and an animal happened to come up to you and, without any provocation or initiation from you, basically started sexually assaulting you, yeah, no. You're not really at fault there. Unfortunately, that might actually be how some zoo files are made. It's mentioned at some point, but I can't recall if it's been mentioned already or if it's to come. I'm very tired. Anyways, it's not uncommon that zoo files have some sort of formative memory from their childhood where they were sexually abused by a domesticated animal or household pet. In a similar vein to how those who are sexually abused as children can then go on to sexually abuse others, zoo files end up focusing their sexual energy into animals. Whether this is some means of taking back power or it's that their brain was conditioned at just the right age, I don't know. What I do know is that a human who is a victim of sexual abuse by an animal is still a victim. Even if the animal doesn't necessarily understand the implications of what it was doing, it still negatively affects the person they do it to. If that behavior in the animal is persistent, then it would either require corrective behavioral training or, sadly, might have to be put down to avoid it then sexually abusing others. Now, if that were ex expressly the situation we were talking about here, all would be fine and dandy, but I think we all know that this isn't the extent of sexual interaction that these guys are referring to. No, no, in all likelihood, this guy is referring to animals who are already living in a household with a zoophile as their pet. If you have an animal for a pet who is not spayed or neutered and that animal approaches you and tries to sexually engage, it is your responsibility as their caregiver to indicate that this behavior is inappropriate. The animal, though they may not understand why, should not be seeking sexual reciprocation from their main caregiver. It takes advantage of the inherent power dynamic between pet and owner. Like, if you were really so concerned with your dog having a mate to screw whenever they get randy, you'd get another bleeding dog. When it comes to interest in human genitals, zoophiles are more likely reading sexual interest from a different, completely benign canine behavior, that being licking dirty underwear. Dogs address, communicate, and largely understand the world around them through scent. It's why they want to sniff everything when you go out on a walk. They are specifically drawn to strong odors, and at the end of the day, that ends up being your dirty drawers and sometimes your sweaty gym clothes. They are attracted to the sweat, the salt, and the plethora of pheromones soaked into the fabric from the apocrine glands in your crotch, not explicitly your genitals. Our pets love us and want to be closer to us, and since they predominantly understand the world through smells, they attempt to better understand us through our most potent smells. They don't really understand the notion that this might be inappropriate behavior. Dogs might also chew on your clothes, which again, isn't because of any sexual interest, but rather due to the sense in the fabric. Additionally, they could be eating it because they're developing pica, they're bored and want someone to pay attention to them, or maybe they're teething. That's actually fairly common with puppies. Cats do this too, as far as I'm aware, though maybe not to the same degree. Sorry, I've never owned a cat, only pet sat. Depending on your reaction to seeing them with this piece of clothing could even make them view it as some sort of a game where you chase after them like they have a toy. Point is, dogs going after your genitals or trying to get into contact with things that have touched them? Yeah! not sexual in nature. Furthermore, dogs don't generally just walk up to their owners and start licking their private areas, unless you present your sweaty naked ass to them. That would be a trained behavior, either in that they were directly encouraged to engage in the behavior, or in that they engaged on their own and then were encouraged or else not discouraged from continuing by a responsible fucking adult, thus leaving them under the assumption that the behavior is appropriate or at least tolerable. And I know that I'm predominantly referencing the behaviors of dogs here, but that's because dogs are the most likely animal to be victimized in this manner. The whole sometimes the animal approaches you first thing, that's not gonna happen with animals who have to be purposely goaded into engaging with humans, like horses or any animal that's going to be too small for an adult human, like rats, cats, rabbits, chinchillas, or maybe like goats or something, I don't know. Dogs serve as a common domesticated pet and dogs are the ones that are probably going to sniff your 
junk at some point because that's actively a part of how they socialize, so dogs, large breed dogs in particular, end up being the most viable victim pool who might exhibit behavior that seemingly aligns with a zoophile's narrative. Little more difficult to say the animal is acting on its own with a horse, since from what I've been able to find through my <sighs> research, zoophiles have to coat themselves in mare pheromones to get male horses to bang them. Now gee, doesn't that sound coercive? See, none of these arguments work, but you'll hear them repeated ad nauseum from zoophiles who try to justify their compulsions because they think that repeating it enough will convince everyone else like they've already convinced themselves. Except not all the rest of us are suffering from sexual delusions. Professional breeding uses masturbation and penetration. In the professional animal production industry, there rarely is a natural breeding today. The seed is very often extracted from the male animals by using artificial vaginas, manual masturbation, or even anal electrostimulation of the prostate. The seed is then inserted into the female animal by funneling and similar technological means which penetrate. Usually during these procedures, the animals are fixated such as they are unable to move away or fight against this treatment, and more often than not during these procedures, animals are manhandled or need to be drugged. The zoophiles specifically point out that we resent these procedures absolutely. The fixation, the involved violence, the narcotics involved make it impossible that the animal is consenting to it or enjoying it. Another problem would be that the sexual actions on animals are legal if done for commercial reasons. These can, for example, be the refinement of a cow breed, cheap mass production of meat, and other goods derived from animals, or to keep the breed alive. In these circumstances, it is completely disregarded whether the animal suffers through the treatment or needs to be forced into it. Yet a law criminalizing consensual human-animal intercourse, which can be enjoyable for both parties without any coercion, outlaws basically the same sexual things when done for mutual pleasure. It is therefore evident that the sole motivation behind such a law is to prohibit actions which are seen as disgusting by some. Such a law would establish a penalty for causing no damages at all. An animal is not pondering the underlying morals of a human, it solely judges whether some actions are enjoyable or not, and whether it is therefore agreeing to these or not. Mm, in particular, animals can only judge what is enjoyable in the moment with little to no ability for forethought or afterthought that we are aware of, meaning they lack the ability to assess the consequences of their actions either before or after that action is taken, and they are essentially therein unable to learn from mistakes that have negative effects that are not immediately visible. The base of the anti zoophilia group's arguments for a general criminalization is fundamentally flawed. Notice how they've collectively categorized those who have created laws making it illegal for people to sexually abuse animals as being a part of anti zoophilia groups, when in reality they're just regular people. There are no anti zoo agencies fighting to restrict the rights of zoophiles and put to death any animal they might come into contact with. Who do you think we're talking about here, PETA? But golly gee, if them putting forth the narrative that anti-zoophilia groups are creating laws to disenfranchise them doesn't sound like they're being discriminated against. Wow, wow, zoophiles making up a whole ass government conspiracy so they can play the victim and act like fucking animals is some marginalized sexuality? I never would have guessed. The law shall not pursue and judge on whether the animal was penetrated as an indicator or whether or not it was sexually fulfilling for the human. It must be based on how the animal liked the interaction, whether it is consenting, recall our discussion of animal communication abilities above, or is the animal forced to do this, was it uncomfortable? Because why should the sexual intercourse between human and animal be prosecuted when the animal enjoyed it? A special clause in the law against this ultimately solely casts a specific moral point of view in stone. By this implication, if I were to sexually assault someone and I got them to come during the process, do I then get to argue that it wasn't sexual assault because they enjoyed it because they came? Fuck off.
Finally, the Zooier Than Thou podcast, probably the source I'll have the most to say about, mostly because Sappho using this particular source basically discredits her and her entire video. So the podcast was originally created and run by two self-proclaimed zoophiles, Fausti and Toggle, their real names being Douglas Brian Spink and Charles Alexander Berry, respectively, and both of them are guilty of contradicting the principles and claims about the zoophile community Sappho has cited to us thus far. I say it was because as of January 2020, Douglas Brian Spink lost his life to his long fight against colon cancer. Yes, the zoophile animal rapist died of butt cancer. I'll give you a moment to express your jubilation. <laughs> Oh, I also want to make note of this because it's made my life significantly easier, but in a past video, I criticized someone using Kiwi Farms as a primary resource when trying to call someone out. This was under the pretense that Kiwi Farms is, first and foremost, a gossip forum, and you can't immediately trust everything on there as the gospel truth. But that glosses over the specific users who do very real good on the forums. These are the people who go out of their way to sort through the most disgusting elements that others are unwilling to. Those who pay out of their own pocket to get information on those whom they believe to be dangerous cows and who then archive all of that necessary information. The zoo sadism leaks would have amounted to nothing if there was no one to take it upon themselves to go through gigabytes of disgusting material in an effort to match faces and names to crimes. I legitimately feel like those users do good work, and so any forum threads with an abundance of these particular types of users are probably going to yield lucrative results. The problem is that not every user on the site is like that, but they wanna be. There were definitely users of that ilk in there, but luckily there was also enough useful information that I can sort of just ignore it. So you know, case by case basis as to whether a forum thread is going to be useful. Luckily for me, farmers don't like zoo files. I went through the Kiwi farm thread for both Fausti and Toggle multiple times to double check the information because yeah, still don't take that stuff at face value. And to the users who actually did something in those threads, we thank you for sharing your research with us. All right, with all that said, we'll talk about Toggle first. His real name being Charles Alexander Berry. While also going by Buck Daniel Riley online, Buck being the term for a sexually mature male rat, his fursona of choice, so nobody should be surprised. Since he's technically the lesser of the two evils, in the sense that I have a less definitive record of outright criminal activity on his end. So remember when Sappho was all like, oh, cub porn and fucking puppies is basically the equivalent of pedophilia, right? Okay, well, Toggle is actually totally fine with cub porn. Not even just that he's okay with it, he expressly lists it as one of his kinks. Underage characters, too. We're all now tangentially aware that those suffering from one paraphilia often end up suffering from multiple. So maybe a zoophile disagreeing with this stance of come porn is seen as pedophilia shouldn't be someone you cite when trying to explain that zoophiles aren't a bunch of mentally ill people refusing to acknowledge their condition or seek out treatment for it. Or are we assuming it's drawn or written cub porn and therefore it's okay because it's fictional? Now, obviously, I can't say outright that Toggle has any actual sexual interest in children, mostly because the only underage not safe for work content I'm aware of him making are stories and erotic role plays that specifically put him in the role of or else are told from the perspective of the underage character in question. Toggle cites having been sexually abused by an animal when he was a preteen, so stories of this nature where he's putting himself back into the role of a child could be seen as just as much of a coping mechanism reverting to a child-centric persona whilst remaining in full control of any and all sexual interaction. It's not uncommon for victims of sexual assault to develop means of coping with their trauma that can make it seem like they're supporting it from an outside or else otherwise uninformed perspective. So with that said, while I obviously can't make a determination as to whether Toggle is attracted to children in any way, he does support, and to an extent create, cub porn. Whether that be because he uses it for his own personal therapeutic purposes, that doesn't really change that Sappho's indicated to us that this is viewed akin to pedophilia in the zoophile community. Plus, even if Toggle himself isn't acting as the part preying on the minor, he is playing the part of a minor for those people when he role plays. Made worse are that any written stories he'd put out would essentially be erotic fiction for pedophiles or children, neither of which is good. However, to tie into that, Toggle posted this Twitter thread related to zoo sadists creating their 
own pride flag, gross, which, while focusing on how Toggle himself would personally respect non-practicing Zeusadists, also indicated that he felt pedophiles faced an unfair stigma in wider society. As in, he thinks the societal stigma that says it's bad to fuck kids and therein makes us wary of people who claim to want to do that is unfair. Also, I'm gonna go over this thread because I want you guys to really understand the levels of hypocritical denial these guys are steeped in. Reading now for context because I see you guys out there listening to my videos as background noise, and I got you. <clears throat> from Toggle. Okay, I can't ignore this anymore. I haven't said anything about this because I haven't really been sure how to respond, but I kind of have to address this. Thread incoming. I will absolutely support someone who comes to me and says, I have Zeus sadist fantasies, but I don't ever want to act upon them. What I can't support is a Zeus sadist pride movement, even if you're non-practicing. And I think it's fair that you ask for an explanation. Is it really? I will give the benefit of the doubt that someone who made a non-practicing Zeus sadist flag had noble intentions. Here's the problem. The practicing sadists use those type of things as dog whistles, and we have evidence that they do this. Ample evidence. Ugh, this ought to be good. My super ears are burning. <laughs> The organizers of the Zeusadis ring always touted themselves as non-practicing, and they used this to signal to each other, recruit, and groom members into their groups. Oh, well, gee, doesn't that sound familiar? Frankly, there's nothing on that flag that indicates non-practicing anyway. I think it's imperative for non-practicing Zeusadis to find support, to keep each other from practicing, etc. And I will support you if you confide in me and actually aren't a practicing sadist, but I feel that a pride flag is a very bad idea. So you'll ask, what about pedophiles? Don't think anybody was asking that, my guy. Here's the thing. Pedophiles are attracted to kids and are fighting a dangerous stigma that keeps them from getting resources they need. They have to be seen and visible as non-offending, functional members of society to fight that stigma. Hilariously, when I looked up the direct definition of stigma, it was defined as a visible indicator of disease. Just funny. Zeusadism is an attraction to harm. The essence of harm is unavoidable. There is no unfair stigma in wider society, though maybe you feel that you're stigmatized among other zoos or furries, and there's nothing barring you from resources to get help. Right, cool, so confirmed, Toggle thinks the association of disgust levied against those who are outed as being attracted to children is unfair. Look, I'm not gonna act like I'm a professional in this matter. I will say that yes, because of mandatory reporting laws, it can be difficult for non-offending pedophiles to get help, especially if in doing so, their condition is outed to their community. This would no doubt turn others away from seeking that same level of help. But I also feel the need to point out that a therapist is probably gonna react the same way if you tell them you can only get your rocks off by mutilating a puppy. I don't think that's pedophile exclusive. I sincerely think that Zeus sadists would get much the same reaction. I don't really know how to fix or get around that other than freely making available more accessible resources where pedophiles could get help. Little difficult, I know, it's not like it's a suicide hotline or something. A paraphilia helpline? People have this immediate discomfort that bubbles to the surface when a person confesses that they have a sexual interest in children, and for the most part, I think this probably stems from a desire to want to protect those children. However, I would argue that this level of disgust itself is what prevents pedophilia from getting any sort of footholding in society as a purported sexuality. Leniency creates complacency. Toggle also gets his wires crossed quite a bit here, as we'll see him argue that non-practicing pedophiles faced an unfair stigma but not non-practicing zoo sadists because for them, harm is a part of the process and therefore completely unavoidable in any instance were they to offend, ignoring the fact that harm is also unavoidable were a pedophile to offend. Like, the harm doesn't come from the fantasy, it comes when you try to turn the fantasy into a reality. As for Zeus, 
lose, our pride is in showing that there is nothing wrong with us, that the practice of our sexuality can be done in ways that honor the well-being and autonomy of our animal partners, something that can't be argued by anyone in the alleged quote-unquote relationship who doesn't have this paraphilia, i.e. the animal. Our pride is saying I'm a zoo and that part of me is something I embrace. For non-practicing zoo sadists, your ideal path is I have these thoughts that I don't like, but they don't define me. They don't make me bad. It's very different from saying I'm a zoo sadist and I'm embracing that aspect of myself. But as long as pedophiles say they're non-offending, that's fine, right? I mean, you brought them up as your counter to zoo sadists having a pride flag, so doesn't that imply that you'd be okay with non-offending pedophiles having a pride flag and saying this? Or am I understanding that wrong. So here's the deal. Our community can't be tolerant of people who define themselves openly as zoo sadists. I'm sorry for those who do not practice, but the ones who do take advantage of the ambiguity and use it to hide in our spaces. More than that, they are emboldened by it. Wait a minute, I thought you said that for pedophiles, they had to be viewed as openly non-offending functional members of society in order to fight the unfair stigma. Now you're saying that a different group with a different paraphilia shouldn't be open about them having it and being non-offending? But what if they were also outwardly non-offending functional members of society? Isn't that often the facade people try to put across before they're caught? So it's bad for there to be open acceptance of zoosadists, people suffering from a paraphilia that inherently cause as harm because it gives abusers the opportunity to hide in plain sight, but pedophiles, people suffering from a paraphilia that attracts them to unwilling sexual subjects that does inherently cause harm when acted upon, who hide their sexual urges for children whilst gravitating towards careers that specifically put them in contact with potential victims, are unfairly stigmatized. Are you guys recognizing the mental gymnastics that Toggle is doing here? If you're putting Zoo Sadist in your Twitter bio and waving a flag with a slashed paw print to indicate violence toward an animal, I can't support it. I can't. And the community can't afford to, because the reality is that there are abusers who take advantage of our tolerance. If we are a community of people who serve in the interest of animal welfare, we cannot also be the community that caters to people who proudly display that they have a desire to hurt animals. I get it. You need support. You need acceptance. You need people to lift you up, and you should have it. I am that person for one of my friends. Gross. I support him because I know that he's struggling with thoughts he can't control and would rather die than harm an animal. That matters. I encourage you to reach out to people you trust and confide in them. If you mean no harm, you will find support. This isn't a label you have to project and there aren't any barriers that you need to fight by being public and proud and our community can't afford to cater to it. I am willing to trust that the person who desires this flag did so with good intentions, and if they are good intentions, I hope they will trust my experience with how more nefarious sadists operate. They will take advantage of your good-natured outreach and use it to network. Probably by making themselves look like non-offending functional members of society right? A non-practicing zoo sadist flag will serve as a dog whistle. They will use the deniability you give them to dupe people who just don't know any better, and they will prey on the very people you want to inspire to overcome their inclinations. We've seen it happen before. Okay, so confirmed, people who actively want to harm animals use the good intentions of the communities of people who claim to not want that in order to do that very thing. So we should keep beast bestiality illegal in order to protect animals because they are a group that cannot speak on their own behalf and that includes whether or not they think bestiality should be legal and bad faith actors will use that to their advantage to harm them. Like the guy just said that horrible people use the zoo community to recruit others into their ranks and harm animals and is still unironically advocating for zoophiles to have animal fucker rights because they claim they don't want to harm animals, which is the same thing the guys who do want to harm animals start out by doing. He literally just gave us a reason to not accept zoo files. On the one hand, I want to agree with him that a zoo sadist pride flag is a horrible idea, but then it also gets me thinking, huh, so this guy doesn't want a super easy method of self-reporting to tell the rest of us normies who the zoo sadists are. 
interesting. On that note, zoo sadists, the one that seek out content and practice torture, are feeling smug and comfortable right now. There are zoo groups that openly support this content, and we as a community have to make it clear that this isn't tolerable behavior. Explicitly clear. The fact that these groups already exist means that not all zoo files agree with you, dude. Seriously don't see how this Twitter thread would do much to change that. I see this and all I think is like a tiny flea standing on the tallest blade of grass and screaming to the heavens, racism shouldn't exist. Now get to it, minions. Fix the world. Let me just reiterate this again for those of you in the cheap seats. If you participate in a group that shares content of real animals being tortured, you are complicit in what's going on, period. Unacceptable! If admins don't do anything, get the fuck out and never look back. So, make the groups more insular and exclusive to the zoo sadist tastes. Don't like, report them, maybe? Try to have them taken down? Expose them? Nah, just leave and let them carry on with their degeneracy behind closed doors in a space where you don't have to see it happening, huh? This is something we have to deal with, and we can't do it while members of our community are unwittingly providing a banner for them to congregate under. Oh, but not a banner like, I don't know, animal fuckers though, right? Only a banner like non-offending sadistic animal fuckers. Gotta be real specific. If you feel you need a banner, you can do so outside of the zoo community. Don't wave that flag here for dog's sake. Wow, figuratively actually just saying don't group that shit with my group because y'all make us look bad. Yeah, so remember that whole giving him the benefit of the doubt because maybe his cub porn is therapeutic? Yeah, just forget I said anything. This means that one of the guys behind the podcast Sappho is citing is okay with what Sappho has described to us as being basically pedos in the zoophile community. He even might be engaging with them erotically behind closed doors. And so what, we're just supposed to hope those beliefs and proclivities don't bleed through into what he's promoting in the podcast? When he's this nonsensically diuretic through text? Can we also appreciate that the steps by which Toggle cites zoo sadists using dog whistles to recruit and groom others into their ranks are literally the same things that zoo files do. Like the Zeta symbol they use to signal to other animal fuckers that they're down for that dog dick too. That's a dog whistle because only select people would generally be aware of what that symbol means, specifically those from zoo file circles where it's used in abundance. Us normies only know what it means because someone came out and connected the dots. Like, it's literally a thing that the two idiots running the Zooier Than Thou podcast have done. On the podcast, they have spoken against harming animals, but they do exactly that behind the scenes, and they dog whistle to other zoophiles in this manner. Give me a second to get to it. I don't want to spoil too much, but we will even see that Sappho has done this very thing later in this video. Make herself seem less threatening so that she can pull in and groom minors into her beliefs. There are reports of other events of particular note, like him allegedly recording audio of what was effectively a tutorial on blowing a dog, or him retweeting a post from a since-deleted user called Keeping It Canine, saying that zoo files make the best trainers, vets, breeders, caregivers, etc. for animals, sort of just potentially confirming the fear that, yeah, zoo files probably do seek out jobs where they have easy access to animal victims. Unfortunately, I don't have anything to show for these particular ones. I saw them in my preliminary research, but didn't save them like a moron because I wasn't at my desk and then I couldn't find them again later. So yeah, I don't know, take it as you will. Oh, although he did post a Twitter thread where he was allegedly recalling a memory where he sexually abused his dog, Joey. So, you know, we have admitting to a crime and confirmation that he is currently sexually abusing an animal under his care. And we know that this animal could be experiencing negative effects from that abuse in particular because Toggle also admitted on his Twitter at one point that he had to keep a stray dog that he was quote unquote so worried for out on the porch in the cold and the rain because Joey, the dog he was abusing, was too aggressive to allow the stray into the house. Aggression being a particularly common sign of animal sexual abuse. What, am I supposed to be shocked that all of these zoophiles seem to own dogs with aggression issues? Just keep in mind that there's more than what I've listed just here to be concerned about with regards to Charles 
Alexander Barry. I won't be diving too deeply into Toggle beyond this point, but I'll provide links to some videos that talk about him specifically for those who are interested in watching a train wreck in slow motion. Also, side note, people have made what I assume to be reactionary Twitter accounts for him and the Zooier Than Thou podcast, where they basically denounce zoo files and pedos at every turn, which on one hand is kind of great. On the other hand, the downside to that is that it might inadvertently confuse some people into thinking Charles Alexander Barry is against zoophilia and bestiality, when in reality he very much advocates for its acceptance. It's kind of just giving him a better reputation than I think he deserves, but maybe that's just me. Okay, so one of the members of the podcast Sappho has cited creates zoophile pedo porn, admits to currently sexually abusing an animal whom he admits has aggression issues, and apparently thinks sexually abusing children being regarded negatively is an unfair stigma in wider society. What does the other one do? Douglas Bryan Spink. This is gonna be the gross one. I know I say that, but like, seriously. Appearing online under the handle Fausty, Spink was probably the most infamous zoophile you're going to find outside of the zoo sadism crew, mostly because he had been actively vocal about sexually engaging with animals, both online and offline, for years. In that regard, Spink was one of the only zoophiles whose sexual compulsion was known to the public, or at the very least, in the sense that he didn't hide it, even going so far as to mention while he was speaking at a panel for a convention, which he'd violated probation to attend, that he considered his life partner to be a horse named Capone. A horse he stole from someone else, mind you. The first thing we need to understand is that Spink is known as a prolific liar outside of the zoophilia community, as he has been caught lying about his criminal convictions on the Zooier Than Thou podcast in the past. And yes, criminal convictions, as this man was actively convicted for harming animals among many other things multiple times. So just keep in mind that anytime something is reported from Spink, it should be taken with a grain of salt, as we can't always be sure where he's telling the truth. YouTube user Toad McKinley has three documentary style videos on both Spink and Toggle, though primarily the former. For anyone interested in a more in-depth breakdown of the information known about the two, I would recommend going to his channel and checking out those videos. Although please note that the reports about Toggle's real name in the third video have since been found to be in correct. Much of this information even comes from a book written directly about Spink and his personal experiences called Uniquely Dangerous by Corrine Maloney. No, I'm not kidding. There's a lot in this situation that sounds like I'm kidding, but it's just strangely convenient for us in that regard. Or it's just that deplorable. Spink reports that he was sexually assaulted by a family friend at the age of eight, and that at the time, he psychologically replaced the role of his attacker with a pet snake, giving us a possible origin for his sexual proclivities. I wasn't lying when I said a lot of zoophiles started out as people abused as kids, either by animals or by humans. Many of these people started as victims, but have, lacking psychological intervention or aid, since progressed to the role of victimizer. This would become true for Spink entering his early teen years, as he would recall his first wanted sexual experiences being the serial raping of a neighbor's dog. Remember that thing that Sappho said we normies didn't have to worry? about. Whilst attending university, Spink lived with a couple who bred golden retrievers. I'm sure you can already pick up on the issues to come. A woman named Judy, who had a stake in the couple's dog breeding business and whom Spink met while living there, would later become his wife. The couple asked Spink to move out in 1994 upon finding out and later reporting that Spink would physically abuse the dogs under his care. Unacceptable! Spink moved in with his future wife after this. Judy tried to adopt a puppy from that same couple that had kicked out her boyfriend, but they refused under the assumption that Spink would abuse this dog as well. Judy and Spink then went on to establish their own breeding business, dealing not just in dogs, but also in trading and training show horses. Through this business, Spink acquired a Holsteiner horse named Capone, the horse he would later identify as his soulmate. I guess. Over the next however many years, it doesn't really matter, Spink and Judy married, moved from Chicago to Oregon, and Spink built himself a small fortune through online business. This might have been why Judy didn't leave him when he was outed by a zoophile watchdog group, but it was, ironically, probably also how he was caught, since the watchdog group had found him when they noticed a new saturation of bestiality content available online. The websites providing all the new material traced directly back to, you guessed it, 
Spink. Since Oregon didn't have bestiality laws until 2016, however, being outed served as the only consequence Spink would face. Because obviously this was before 2016. Judy's choice to stay with her husband didn't end up working out too well for her, as Spink was charged with fraud on numerous accounts and filed for bankruptcy in 2002. He abandoned his wife and stepchildren in 2003, and moved up to Canada before his bankruptcy case could be processed in court. He also admits in the book Uniquely Dangerous that he threatened his wife, Quoted by him, I told her I would gut her like a fish and hang her from a tree by her intestines, into handing over the family dog, a golden retriever named Rion, so he could take it with him. Fearful for her life, Judy conceded to his demands and, of course, handed over Rion. Guy took the family dog away from the kids he's been raising for the better part of a decade at the same time he, their proverbial father, abandoned them because he wanted to screw it. Granted, I don't know how old the kids were when he entered their lives, but still, it was the family dog, not his dog. So, real classy guy we're talking about here. From Canada, he once again moved into a couple's home, this time living exclusively in the barn on the property of fellow equestrian sports and horse trading fan, Corinne Super. The barn would serve as a home not only for Spink, but also his dogs and horses, and the place of operation for the numerous bestiality sites he served as an admin for online. While there, Spink would record record himself abusing the animals housed within the barn. Capone happened to be one of those horses he kept. To my knowledge, Capone was actually legally owned by his ex-wife Judy at this time. There was effectively some back and forth stealing and reacquiring of this horse for the next few years. It's weird. Spink would then spend about a year or two smuggling drugs back and forth over the US-Canadian border. Bit of a crime jump there, but okay. And after being caught, served only three years of his original 10-year sentence, like because he snitched on someone else to garner a new deal. Upon getting out of prison, Spink began leasing another barn, this time in Custer, Washington, and immediately turned to getting his animals back, all of whom had been under the care of Karen Super for the extent of his incarceration. Super would later give Spink back his dogs, but the ownership of his horses had since been transferred to her, and she didn't just hand them over to him. Unfortunately, while on a phone call with Super trying to get his horses back, the golden retriever Rion was mauled to death in the back ground by other dogs in Spink's care. How the hell do a bunch of dogs maul one of their pack to death? Aggressive behavior problems seems like a good place to start. Spink eventually strong-armed Super into handing over Capone, but Super later hired a team in 2008 to steal the horse back off of Spink's leased property. Spink filed a police report, but since the horse was already under Super's name, she wasn't exactly stealing him from Spink. Then when going to the cops didn't work, Spink turned to the online outlet My Horse Forum to try and save Faith. It was there that his name was connected to the online handle Fausti, and he was outed as a zoophile in the forum and promptly ridiculed. At some point in late 2008, dissatisfied with police not taking his side, Spink snuck into Super's property and stole Capone back himself. With the help of his mother, Spink would then purchase a 22-acre property 30 minutes away from the farm he was already leasing. From the small cabin already built on the property, Spink would abuse the seven dogs and four horses he kept there, including Capone, not only by himself, but also through pimping the animals out to other zoophiles online. As listed in Spink's evidentiary hearing and sentencing hearing, police cite having arrested another man on Spink's property, along with recorded videos of said man sexually engaging with at least three of Spink's dogs, as well as a note he had in his possession that listed the names of the dogs present and the sizes of their genitals. Well, That note, having been found in the man's car, means that he had to have been given the dog's names and sizes before arriving at Spink's property. Therefore, before the man in question had ever met Spink's dogs, and therein Spink would have been the only person who could have provided that information. And realistically, what other reason would he have to provide it other than to pimp out his poor pooches? Yeah, so if you haven't clued in on it yet, the police issued a search of Spink's property seizing his animals and the recorded bestiality videos with the other sicko they found there. They did this because while living on this property, I think outside of the purview of his parole officer, he got into contact with a man named James Tate, who was serving time in jail for, say it with me folks, animal sexual abuse. Almost like it's a pattern. 
In particular, Tate was in jail because of an event where he and a few others had snuck onto someone's property to record video of one of them coaxing the property owner's horse to... Look, we all know exactly what they were doing to that animal. Unfortunately for everyone involved, the man taking it had his colon ruptured by the horse, almost like it wasn't designed to take the sexual organ of an animal of such vastly different species and size, and after being unceremoniously dumped at the hospital by an accomplice, died. Internet veterans may already be familiar with this particular situation as it was filmed, uploaded, and online dubbed Death by Horsecock or One Guy One Horse. The guy who died? Mr. Hands. Yeah, so while Spink was running what was effectively a bestiality brothel, he was also apparently dumb enough to attempt to make direct contact with someone who was not only effectively in jail for bestiality, specifically at this time he would be in jail for three counts of felony animal cruelty, but whose actions actually incited Washington to create animal abuse laws specifically to deal with animal sexual abusers like him and Spink. For for someone supposedly so smart, Spink kept doing really dumb things. But I can only imagine it had to do with him engaging in criminal activity for so long and not getting caught that he had gotten cocky, since that's actually quite common, but that's really me just speculating. Spink's actions were discovered when his caseload was, quite worryingly, passed off to a new probation officer under the pretense that it had become a less pressing matter and that Spink was, assumedly, less likely to offend. This new probation officer took interest in the fact that Spink was blatantly contacting a felon against the terms of his probation. Considering Spink was not particularly shy about his belief that sexual relationships with animals should be normalized, his his probation officer had no real problem connecting Spink to animal abuse. Not only were they readily able to explore the net and find multiple bestiality sites, all run under Spink's Fausty persona, Spink even foolishly spoke with James Tate while he was in prison on phone calls that were, unsurprisingly, because the guy was in prison, recorded, where he effectively admitted to engaging in such actions. Overall, this would lead to the April 14th raid on Spink's bestiality reality brothel in 2010. Oh yeah, and that guy who was found in Spink's cabin along with the videos of him sexually abusing the dogs? Yeah, Spink's voice was also actively heard on those recordings. So there's no question that he was present at the time and therein condoned the sexual abuse. Despite, in court, Spink trying to be all, well, if I'd known the man was a degenerate, surely I wouldn't have let him near my dogs. That same man was a convicted child rapist from the UK who had had even created child pornography, and though Spink is not connected to those crimes, it shows not only the company he kept, but also the sort of people he was willingly pimping his animals out to. Like, you want to come across as advocates for animal sexual rights, but also think it's a-okay to pimp them out to a literal convicted child molester? In court, the Honorable Judge Ricardo Martinez determined that Spink had violated the conditions of his supervision in four ways. In that he had committed animal cruelty, he had failed to submit truthful probation reports, he had left the district without permission on two occasions, and he had directly associated with persons convicted of a felony. Spink was sentenced to three years in prison and two years of further supervised release, with the preface that 180 days of that could be served in a halfway house as a means of reintegration into society. All of Spink's animals were taken away and Capone was sent back to Judy for the final time. Five months into Spink's stay at the halfway house and he was taken into custody yet again. Again, this time as a means of finally charging him with three counts of animal cruelty stemming from the April 14th, 2010 raid, something which had originally been put off in favor of focusing on more solid charges. Spink was charged on December of 2012, pled not guilty, posted bond, and later fled to the farm of an ex-cellmate in 2013. The fact that he was living on a farm and therefore had ample access to animals once again evaded the probation officer for a worrying period of time before they demanded he live somewhere else. Spink rented a new property and filed it with his probation officer, but never actually moved to that address, instead staying exactly where he was on the farm. From there, he started right back up with his pattern of animal abuse, but now introduced himself as Douglas LeConte to hide his criminal past. Not only having managed to reacquire one of his previous equine victims, Spink also convinced the farm owner to purchase a Caucasian Shepherd dog under the provision that Spink would train it to help deal with a pack of coyotes plaguing this woman's sheep. 
Unsurprisingly, this dog would serve as yet another victim under Spink. His name was Baca. Even worse was that this same farm Spink was now living on just happened to neighbor another farm owned by a man named Andrew Johnston, a dog breeder. One whom Spink had even worked with in the past and whom he had attempted to acquire a puppy from, thankfully unsuccessfully. However, now Spink set his eyes on a different one of Johnston's dogs, this time a dog from the same lineage as the puppy he'd wanted, a five-year-old boar bull Kangal mix named Genghis. Spink may have even felt owed this dog as the lineage originally came from a breeding between one of Johnston's dogs and one of Spink's victims, even though Spink had failed to come through on his end of that deal and therein not been owed the puppy. For months, Spink would secretly feed and interact with Genghis through the fence separating the two properties, gaining the dog's trust for nearly a year. February 21st, 2014, Spink cut a hole in the fence, removed Genghis from the property, and along with Baca, fled the farm. By February 23rd, Johnston had come to realize that Genghis was missing, and so the farm owner was left to deal with the consequences of Spink's theft. As Johnston was none too happy to hear of Spink's actions, even less so upon remembering who Spink was. The feds were contacted once Spink's past crimes came to light. Spink was arrested a week later at the home he'd rented a half hour away from the farm, no sign of Genghis. In 2014, Spink's probation was revoked by court judge Ricardo Martinez, and he would remain in prison for nine more months, even going back to jail a week after being released for another 90 days. Spink was ordered to report to Whatcom County Jail in January of 2015, but failed to show and so a warrant was put out for his arrest. For eight more months, Spink hid in Canada on the farm of a longtime boyfriend, Ronald Matuszczak. This next bit is really gonna make one wonder as to whether the criminal justice system actually even does anything. Okay, so on August 9th, 2015, Spink suffered what was likely a partial psychotic break, dressed in only a towel, acting erratically, and accompanied by a large breed dog. Spink was arrested and the dog was put into the custody of Matuszczak. While the dog would later be identified by officers as as Johnston's stolen boar ball Kangal Genghis, sadly, he would also never be seen again. The Ontario Provincial Police realized that Spink was a felon with a warrant out for his arrest, but because of some sort of fuck up, Spink was released that same day and had to be arrested again on August 11th. He was deported the next day despite his active warrant, was once again mistakenly released by border authorities. He would then stay with his mother in the States for a few days before, unsurprisingly, running right back to Canada. Spink was able to remain there for two more months before he was arrested once more for another possible psychotic break, but this time one where he set fire to Matuszczak's home and was found to be holding the man, now probably his ex-boyfriend, in a chokehold before he would threaten bystanders, break into a neighbor's house, terrifying its dog, before running down the street and straight into the cops. Spink then violently resisted arrest, denting the car door and smashing his own head against the car's plexiglass window multiple times while inside, eventually having to be carried into hospital by seven officers as he continued to scream and lash out. When confronted about his behavior in court in December of 2015, Spink was only able to explain his actions as PTSD suffered at the hands of law enforcement, which nobody was really believing. Yeah, sure, Spink, you got PTSD from being arrested, but the animals you sexually abuse on a daily basis aren't negatively mentally affected by it at all. He was sentenced to five more months in jail, after which he would be deported back to the United States because Canada didn't want to waste any more tax dollars on him. Once again, despite the active warrant out for his arrest in Washington, Spink was released into the care of his mother Claire in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Nobody is going to be super shocked when the guy who demonstrated numerous possible psychotic breaks over the course of a year exhibits yet another one, this time with a gun involved, because it's the States. While living with his mother, on April 4th, 2016, Spink took hold of his mother's 38 caliber pistol and screamed that he was going to unalive himself. During the process of trying to calm him down, at least three shots were discharged before Spink ran from the home, gun still in tow. Luckily for anyone around at the time, Spink promptly ditched the pistol, though he still had two knives on him when he was struck by a vehicle and eventually convinced a passerby to give him a ride. It didn't take much of his incoherent rambling for the driver to then realize he wasn't quite in 
his right mind and demand that he exit the car. Spink then reportedly tried to break into a woman's home at 6 a.m., but fled as soon as she went for her own gun. He would later try to hold up at a gas station and would, of course, fight back when police caught up to him. Eventually, he was restrained and taken to a psychiatric facility where he would remain for a week and be arrested once more upon his release. Spink had 17 charges filed against him for this, 12 of which were felonies, but someone reduced those charges to only three misdemeanors, Spink serving another year in prison, including time served with one more year of probation. Anyone who says the justice system does its job is deluding themselves. Spink would be set free once again in February of 2017 and would last basically the duration of his probation before he would get caught, yet again, in the possession of an animal that he was, yeah, definitely sexually abusing. Nine months into his probation, a mental health warrant was issued on Spink as he had been living out of his own car for some time, hadn't checked in with his mother, and was avoiding his probation officer. At this time, he had also required yet another victim, this time in the form of a dog named Cav, whom he even managed to get registered as his service animal, despite being a felon convicted of animal abuse. After tracking him down, when police indicated that there was a mental health warrant out for Spink, the man held a machete to Cav's throat and threatened the dog's life if police tried to take him in. Such an animal lover! Police luckily coaxed Cav to safety after Spink dozed off and the dumbass was promptly tackled and arrested again. Okay, maybe at this point he can complain about PTSD from the police. In September of 2018, Spink pled guilty to charges that would see him served with 11 months in jail, including time served, with two years of probation afterwards, and the promise to never again own animals in Pennsylvania. Spink then then went online to bitch ineffectually about the services that had seen his animals taken away from him and rehomed with loving families, as well as to network with other zoophiles. A few months later, March 20th, 2019, Spink and Toggle launched the Zooier Than Thou podcast. So let's make sure we're getting everything straight here. Sappho, in an effort to demonstrate to us that zoophiles are not only intimately concerned about animal welfare, but also aren't the animal raping degenerates the layman would normally perceive them to be, sends us to a podcast run by a man who has, according to his own accounts and criminal record, sexually assaulted a neighbor's dog for years, abused the dog he was supposed to be training under the breeder whose farm he was living on, filed for bankruptcy, abandoned his family, and fled to Canada when charged with multiple accounts of fraud, avoiding his court prosecution, threatened his wife so he could steal the family dog so he could then sexually abuse it, abused animals and ran bestiality websites from a farm in Canada, smuggled drugs for a year, stole his ex-wife's horse, stole that same horse again from someone else, operated a bestiality brothel from which he pimped his animals out to convicted sexual abusers, escaped prosecution again by fleeing to Canada, lied to probation officers and broke his probation restricting him from being in contact with animals, stole both a neighbor's dog and the dog of the farm owner whose property he was living on, failed to report to jail and fled to Canada again, had three different violent psychotic breaks, all of which he was arrested for, and threatened the life of a dog under his care because the police were trying to arrest him. Truly a visible, non-offending, functional member of society. And here Sappho is, citing his podcast under the pretense that this man is a friend to animals. Police. Now, Spink's repertoire before even having started his podcast is more than enough to recognize that he's not exactly an animal advocate. But to top that off, his time operating the podcast has been mired with blatant lies about the actions of himself and other zoophiles, and damaging takes meant only to weasel any potential consequences away from the zoophile community as a whole. Take, for example, when the zoo sadism leaks dropped, that same event that Sappho cited as being so horrible and deplorable and nothing that any real zoophile would engage in because it's so awful. And Spink decided to take it upon himself to announce that the logs were completely fake, that Caro the wolf was completely innocent, and that this was merely quote-unquote typical furry drama, without having himself even seen the logs at the time. First, connecting all of this to Kiro, who, as I understand it, is a somewhat high-profile furry, is absolutely unfair, as we are going to discuss in detail. Two, these aren't leaks because there's no way to confirm the authenticity of what's actually been released, the majority of which is really just text files 
that people claim are Telegram chat logs. And unfortunately, some people involved in hyping this up last fall were actually caught circulating fake and even malware-laden documents during these claimed leaks. So there's no way to know what's real and what's fake text-wise. So it's important to be clear about what we know is real. Basically, there's some pictures and video files, as I understand it, and what's totally uncertain, namely all the chat logs and other text records that got circulated at the time. Spink spread this falsehood under the pretense that he's always made attempts to stop real Zeusadists when he finds them within his community, and therefore he knows what he's talking about with regards to real Zeusadists and what that looks like. Please note, however, that his quote-unquote experience with stopping real Zeusadists amounted to him talking to a guy about his sick proclivities once. That guy is actually still preying on animals and children to this day. Almost like Spink did basically fuck all in actually fixing the issue at hand because a lecture and making a degenerate animal abuser promise to stop abusing animals doesn't magically undo three decades of deciding raping animals is acceptable behavior. So what real Zeusatis did Spink ever actually stop? By that logic, I expect this lecture to make Sappho suddenly realize that she's in the grasp of a delusion and vigorously seek help to correct it. I don't, by the way. With not only the benefit of hindsight, but also common fucking sense at our disposal, we know that those leaks were, sadly, not faked. So Spink was either dumb and egotistic enough to feel that he was in the right with literally nothing to back it up, or he was just lying for whatever reason, which, given his criminal past involving him doing just that seems a little more likely. On April 27th, 2019, after managing to get his hands on the logs and without himself confirming if they were being investigated, Spink published the full Zeusatis logs undoctored to his Twitter account, hashtagged torture files. He was a dumbass for doing this because not only did these logs contain a plethora of legitimate, not fucking faked animal abuse, gore, and snuff content, it also contained at least one piece of pornographic material featuring a child, and I think we all know what that's considered. When it was outed that Kara was, indeed, the sick fuck that he had been accused of being based on these logs, more or less depending on who you ask, Spink switched from the stance of claiming Kara was entirely innocent to a stance where they could position the guy as a victim of Zeusadist grooming. One. Kira was being groomed by Snake Thing, likely since before he was a legal adult. Kiro did participate in the sharing and consumption of torture videos, but he'd have moments of clarity where he'd be disgusted with himself and try to walk away, but he'd be back again the next day. Being groomed into this stuff is a soul-crushing process, and Kiro's was steeped in it for years. That he doesn't seem to have ever ended up participating himself is noteworthy given that information. Mind you, much like when claiming Kiro's innocence, Spink and Toggle had nothing to substantiate this new take on the situation, yet they proudly proclaimed it on their podcast. Even when Snake Thing, one of the most prominent Zeusadists in the leak, was arrested, Spink took to the podcast to claim that there was nothing definitively connecting the real-life person Levi Dane Simmons to the online handle Snake Thing. In truth, it was right there in the logs, and had he actually decided to read them, he might have figured that out. Despite this, Spink and Toggle promoted what were effectively their own personal dreams about the leaks as though they were a fact on their podcast. Once more, they attempted to virtue signal by decrying that Zeusadists, in particular, needed to be stopped. Thanks, fuckos, we never would have been able to figure that out without your help. Fun fact, uh, Spink actually suspected Toggle of being a part of the Zeusadism leak, and quietly confronted him about it. I'm sad to say that there was some infighting in our group, too. One thing that breaks down in this dark world is trust. Trust is so important for normal, healthy people, but it's a liability when everyone you're talking to is saying, trust me, it's all okay, and lying through their teeth. Who can you trust? No one. Not even your friendly rat co-host or other people involved that I won't name. No one can be trusted. Yep. I did pull Toggle up one afternoon. Things were lining up in some uncomfortable coincidences at that point. Too many to just simply ignore, so I confronted him. 
all of that was necessary because we're dealing with a world where lies are absolutely the coin of the realm. I fucking hated doing that to Toggle. It's disgusting. And I'm disgusted that I know how to do that. In the end, there would be nothing to connect Toggle to the leaks, but the fact that Spink suspected him in the first place is at least something of note. That means that Spink was actively working with someone whom he believed there was a chance might be a zoo sadist, or at the very least, he was someone who demonstrated enough traits that allowed Spink to make that assumption. Now, I don't know what traits a person normally has to showcase for that to be obvious, outside of just blatantly physically abusing animals, but I think it shows that Spink seemingly recognized these traits in Toggle enough to be concerned about it. Even if it didn't result in Toggle being a part of the zoo sadism leaks, it does potentially indicate that Toggle is noticeably abusive to animals to a degree in his daily life, or else holds beliefs that align with those of zoo sadists, according to his ex-podcast partner at least. After 17 completely unnecessary episodes of the Zooier Than Thou podcast, in that any episode of a podcast for zoophiles is unnecessary unless it's geared towards healing from that delusion. January 23rd, 2020, Douglas Bryan Spink died of butt cancer. Hallelujah. So after all of that, ultimately, what does this even have to do with Sappho's video? A lot, actually. Firstly, Sappho effectively cites the Zooier Than Thou podcast and her two other sources as her evidence regarding how quote-unquote true zoo files are supposed to act. After all, it was one of only three sources she provided. Zoom even cited, while Sappho was interviewing him, that there aren't a whole lot of zoophile role models to reference, so you would think that Sappho would want to cite the most credible, widely recognized, and scrutinized zoophile arguments to support her stance so there's minimal chance of backlash, or maybe a zoophile role model. But instead, she cites these losers. Two men who blatantly break the tenets Sappho has told us true zoophiles are supposed to follow. Sure, one might try to argue that the hosts having questionable past doesn't mean that they're promoting those values, do as I say, not as I do, but if that were the case, why disingenuously lie about that past and make objectively false claims for the sake of furthering the narrative? Plus, didn't we just have Toggle lecturing to us about how zoo sadists use the spaces created by zoophiles to dog whistle to other like-minded individuals who want to harm animals under the guise that they are animal advocates? He said we should default to his expertise, so by that logic, we should assume that this is exactly what Spink was doing, shouldn't we? You would think that if there were an effort to improve on past behaviors, one would want to acknowledge the mistakes made as an effort of teaching others. When someone is hiding what they did, it doesn't exactly mean that they're trying to learn from it, because hiding that information makes it impossible for any critics to take it into consideration. Bada bing bada boom, y'all already know that this is dishonest as all get out. Not only has Spink run his own bestiality brothel in the past, pimping out dogs and horses to animal and apparently child abusers alike, he has also stolen another person's animals on multiple occasions because he wanted to screw them, something which Sappho tried to preemptively gaslight her audience into believing wasn't a legitimate concern. He's demonstrated his willingness to lie and deceive law enforcement in instances where it benefits him, he threatened human and animal lives and abused used them to serve his own needs, even outside of the sexual ones, so zoophiles can't make any excuse for it, and he suffered multiple psychotic breaks, something for which zoophilia is supposedly an early warning sign. And I feel like I need to explain this to really get the point across, but sexualities are not generally an early warning sign of psychosis. But paraphilia sure as hell can be! I mean, sure, maybe if someone who was gay or bisexual their whole life suddenly woke up one day totally straight without any warning or prompting, maybe there's like a brain tumor going on there, I'll give you that. But that's about it. Oh, also, in case I hadn't already fervently gotten across that zoophilia is a sexually based paraphilia, and so all of this faux concern for animal welfare is sexually based, uh, those avatar images you see on the Zooier Than Thou podcast thumbnails and advertising, they cut off at the hips, but the full images for those characters are naked and with genitals included! Don't know about you guys, but none of my avatars happen to have a default nude base. It's almost like that's really weird to include. Even this one out here looking like a pink couch. <laughs> Uh, right, uh, 
I feel the need to note here that I have just gone on for more than 21 pages about how garbage and disingenuous Sappho's resources are, and I didn't even look at the podcast episode she gave us. Honestly, I don't really want to listen to any episodes of a zoophile podcast, but oh, I'm sure there's more dumbass arguments in favor of zoophilia contained in the podcast episode too. Y'all can call me lazy for not bothering to go over it, it's fine, I'll just assume that if the podcast contained any arguments she thought were particularly strong, Sappho would have then mentioned them in her own video. So having gone over the links Sappho provided individually and the two men running the podcast she cited, I can confidently say that all of them provide arguments that are just as disingenuous and riddled with falsities as Sappho's, or else they act in ways that directly go against the tenets Sappho wants us to believe real zoophiles abide by. Once more, these people cannot provide valid arguments for their claimed sexuality because it's not a sexuality. They are all under a common delusion and that delusion is causing them to see things in a way that benefits or confirms that worldview. Mental illness doesn't let you know that it's mental illness. It does everything it can to convince you that it is the truth. So is it more likely that this small group of people is suffering from a paraphilia that leads them to justify compulsions of animal sexual abuse? Or that everyone else outside of their community is under a common shared delusion that animals are too dumb to consent because we want to be the top of the food chain. If you guessed the second option, please seek therapy. Oh shit, there's still some conversation between Sappho and Zoom. All right, who wants more disingenuous arguments and falsities? I'm adding this a little after the fact, but having gone through this video recently, I felt this might be worth pointing out. During this interview with Zoom, Sappho uses a lot of what are generally known as leading questions. What that means is that Sappho herself, within the question, preemptively gives the answer that she wants Zoom to respond with. A good interviewer will ask questions that require the interviewee to fill in the gaps in their own words. This could come in the form of questions like, how did that make you feel? How would you describe the situation from your perspective. Why do you say that? Leading questions, on the other hand, are formatted in a way that seeks to elicit a specific answer. Questions like, and when that happened, you felt violated, correct? So you owned a gun that's the same caliber as the murder weapon, don't you? You planned on doing this once you had the time, didn't you? These questions effectively pull the interviewee along in the intended direction the interviewer wants things to go. Sometimes, even if the answer provided within the question isn't correct, the interviewee will still agree that it is truthful because they've subconsciously picked up on the notion that this is the desired answer from them. They might occasionally offer additional input, but will usually preface their response with the intended yes or no answer. This is why you might recognize leading questions as something generally objected to in court settings, but they are also generally a no-go in interviews. Basically, a good interviewer who wants the truth from the perspective of their subject will avoid yes or no questions as much as possible. While this interview goes on, keep note on how Sappho phrases her questions, because in doing so, you'll start to notice how Sappho is leading Zoom by partially giving him the answers that she wants to hear. She even had to step in at one point because Zoom talks about his mate lacking sexual maturity, something that Sappho told us earlier was seen in the Zoom community as equivalent to pedophilia because at that point it looked like she was platforming the equivalent of a zoo pedophile. So she had to step in and clarify things for us. Make a game out of it, why don't you? See how many leading questions you can find in this video. And if you're above the legal drinking age and want to spice things up, take a shot for each one. Even like professional dog trainers, um, they'll masturbate their dogs during training because it is right. right. <laughs> yeah, it is because it helps them with stress release and feeling better and it's used as a training tool. Extraordinary claims, extraordinary evidence. Who wants to bet that Sappho is just repeating this because she read it off of Zeta Varen Day and not because she's actually aware of any factual case of this happening? Two different zoophiles have now cited the same claim and neither of them have provided something to prove that it's actually a thing. Uh, and, and what's amazing is that you know, with, with this consensual stuff, with a sexually mature animal, people will be all up in arms about that, but they're not against 
uh, these, like, uh, breeding, I don't know what you'd call them, they're, um, like, facilities where they breed dogs, basically, where they forcefully take semen out of one dog and then forcefully inject it into another, and it's like... Puppy mills! The term you are looking for is puppy mills. And it's like, how is that okay? Yeah. Well, to begin with, it's not okay. Plenty of people don't agree with or support the practices of puppy mills. Some will even issue warnings about what pet stores purchase their animals from these sorts of breeding facilities, specifically so that people don't purchase from them and the practice gains less traction. That's also another reason for the adopt don't shop method of taking in and fostering animals. You can be against zoophiles sexually abusing animals and also think that puppy mills and overbreeding dogs in cramped inhumane environments without love or care is bad. Sappho presents this argument as though everyday people are inexplicably against animal human fucking but will give a knowing pass to forced artificial insemination when truthfully most people don't know what goes on at puppy mills, let alone that they even exist. Like this idiot bitch couldn't even come up with the name of these facilities, but everyone else is just supposed to inherently know about and support their existence. Sappho inserts this as a means of making her detractors seem like hypocrites, and guaranteed this is a goalpost that would end up being moved. First it starts off with, they're fine with forced breeding, and then it turns into, well, they're against us screwing animals, but they're not against breeding animals for slaughter, but they're not for giving animals equal rights. It's just a means of making the opposing party look like hypocrites by implying that in a situation where they speak out against zoophilia, they then support everything negative that happens to animals that they are not currently speaking against. So if you speak up against people sexually abusing animals but you don't say anything about the meat industry, you're a hypocrite because all you care about is whether someone has sex with an animal and not the well-being of the animals as a whole. That's the play, and it's stupid. She's basically setting up a situation where the only person who is then allowed to criticize her beliefs is a vegan animal rights activist who, I guess, regularly campaigns against puppy mills and the meat industry and any other bad thing that could happen to an animal. Sappho assumes that everyone who's against her must not be against puppy mills because it makes her argument seem more valid. It's literally just lying to herself to sustain her own narrative. Unsurprisingly, it's a super disingenuous way to present her argument. Everyone's against us and that makes them bigots and if you're against this but not all of these other things that might not be related or you might not even know about, then you're a hypocrite and a bigot who doesn't care about animals. Yeah, what's that thing that tweens and teens and younger generations don't really like to be perceived as nowadays? Bigoted? It's almost like that's specifically what you played to at the beginning of this video when you implied that young people nowadays were only against zoophiles because of bigoted modern day propaganda similar to that of what homosexuals faced in the 70s. Hmm. <laughs> And it's, it's because people view animals as property. They're not viewing them as another living being that deserves the same rights. And that's that's what really gets me uh, about this, this whole thing. You can do both? I don't even know why this is a thing. Like, she's literally just assuming that anyone who doesn't want to fuck animals just views them as property and not as a living creature or a friend or a member of the family. I'll certainly not argue that there aren't animal owners who do this. There are plenty of horrible pet owners and people who straight up abuse animals and should never be allowed near one. Shelters are full of abused and abandoned animals and it's horrible to think that people can get a hold of animals with nothing but malicious intentions in mind. But, as we've seen, that applies to zoophiles too. Spink wasn't exactly treating his animals as equals when he was pimping them out and sharing measurements of their dicks to titillate other degenerates online. Additionally, Sappho putting out this claim that non-zoophiles don't view animals as living beings is ironic, and to be expected, given that paraphilias generally result in the sufferer viewing the subject of their attraction as an object with no rights. So it's a bit weird for Sappho to just be assuming this of everyone who disagrees with zoophilia. You would think that people who didn't have compulsions to sexually dominate less intelligent and emotionally developed life forms would have less issue viewing them as living creatures with feelings who need to be protected. I wonder if there's not a tad bit of projection going on there. So, right, yeah. and that's a huge, that's a huge debate in and of itself, and what, what artificial insemination and what you mentioned, and yeah, we, we could jump down any number of rabbit holes. Stay away from those bunnies! For sure, and now, you had that post about coming out to 
if you want to mention exactly how you came out or who you came out to. Yes, so I take it coming out as like anything where you have to convey an idea, do it in a thoughtful way that's respectful to, in my case, me and my partner, but also my audience, who in this case was my mom. And I thought a lot about terminology I could use and, you know, potentially getting asked questions and uh, how I was going to handle that. And essentially, I only said I used the word attraction. I didn't use the word sex or anything like that. <clears throat> I just said I'm attracted to, in this case, I said other species. I left it very wide open. And I, she didn't, my mom's awesome. She didn't pry me, say, oh, you know, are you screwing your dog? Are you screwing my horses? Blah, blah, blah. Guess it's lucky I'm assuming she didn't have dogs for you to fuck or that question might have been a more pressing issue at the time. You know, she was just like, okay, you know, thank you for telling me. Um, you know, that's, I'm glad that you found someone who you're happy with and I'm glad this worked out. That's, you know, that's all I wanted for you is to just to find someone to be happy. But then she also said, you know, I'm worried about the fact that your partner isn't going to live as long as you and, you know, seeing you fall apart when she's gone. And that's, that's a large part of the pain of this orientation is that many species don't live but a fifth of our lives. <laughs> And that's somehow not suspicious to us at all. Cause you know, maybe things that are naturally supposed to sexually interact and breed will have comparable life expectancies. Hell, these people go after quadrupeds and fish. What am I even expecting? But it really does show just how far they'll make excuses to keep their beliefs. They can convince themselves that a creature with a fifth of their lifespan is their quote-unquote soulmate. Now granted, given that after that animal dies, they'll likely move on to another who could also be their quote-unquote soulmate, but it's sad? Not that I feel bad for animal abusers, but more so that this sounds like a sad existence. To move from one fetishistic object to another, all the while potentially believing that you'll only be able to spend, at most, 10 or 12 years with the love of your life, who you can't ever speak to. Sad. Oh, also, for the record, I don't believe this mother behaved in the way that he's describing. Like, if she wants to record herself being all, mm, yep, sure, I'm totally okay with my son screwing the literal pooch, whatever, but until then, I'm just going to the default of the zoo files probably lying. But, I, you know, and I've come out to a couple of my friends, at least I want to say at least five other people, and I've never once had a bad experience with that. And that's not to say it's 100% safe. You gotta know your audience and you gotta choose your words wisely. And if you don't know your audience, you can just bank on going viral to bring in the audience you want. I assume that's how Sappho's channel had been growing, the zoophiles hearing of their queen. Either that or it was people subscribing to her ironically. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, what's great is that now we have these resources like the Zoo Here the Now podcast that people can watch and really understand these kinds of nuances about what it means to be a zoophile and how, you know, it's it's not about the fetishists and the people that are bestialists, you know, where the, those sorts of things are very antithetical to how we think about our orientation. And but what gets me too is that, you know, people treating animals as property and objects like like their stuffed toys, basically, and it's like... This is actually really sad and pathetic, having already gone over Spink's past criminal and abusive activities. I, I would say that addressing their sexual needs uh, helps them relax, lowers their aggression, and overall helps them feel better and... I want to know where the hell this it lowers their aggression comes from, because all I can find is with regards to how sexual abuse can cause aggression. Or, you know, meekness or overly attention-seeking behavior or the like. Oh god, I hope that's not it. And I'm not saying somebody putting himself onto the animal, because 99% of the time, the animal is the one that's initiating that kind of contact. Like, you know, a lot of people might be familiar with like a dog humping their leg, for instance. Um, that dog sees you as a member of the pack or the herd, and that's how they see things. Wow, she's actually just parroting the points from her resources. Incidentally, with all of the same problems, so it doesn't really matter, Sappho's just as wrong as the German zoo file on Zeta Verande was. And they're the one that's kind of initiating the action, and overall it helps them with their wellness and their well-being. So I just wanted to make a quick note of that. It's part of something that I'm reading from the resources section. Yeah, we can fucking tell. It's becoming really obvious that, much like the zoo file forum she linked to us, Sappho is only going out of her way to gather resources that can prove her narrative, regardless as to whether or not they're peer-reviewed or factually correct. She's not citing studies or research papers to us, she's citing everything she could personally find online that she felt she could use, and it's not a lot. That demonstrates exactly how few resources saying, yeah, zoophilia is totally okay, there are. She had so few to work with that she had to effectively scrounge around for whatever measly favorable arguments she could find. Also, the fact that Sappho is relying on these sources to provide her argument rather than the information she would use to then form her own 
It also shows that Sappho isn't coming up with this shit on her own. She's just mimicking what other people have said in the past and sticking to whatever arguments end up working the best. Building on the same method for zoophile acceptance that Spink was trying to create by openly referring to himself in the public as a person who has sex with animals. Ultimately, this means, on the bright side, Sappho clearly isn't smart enough to be arguing on her own. She's just providing it because it says her way of thinking is correct, which probably means that Sappho isn't going to be able to formulate her arguments to counter what I've pointed out in this video. The downside to this is that while Sappho isn't creating the arguments, her goal is to publicize the arguments in a way that allows her to network with other zoophiles and bring in the ones who maybe can attempt to make those arguments. So she is not smart enough to do it, but she's trying to find people who are. We'll get into that in a sec. Right, yeah, it is, it's excellent to have all these resources available nowadays, and I'd encourage anyone who's considering coming out to be um, prepared to answer questions, help people understand. Yeah, you know, so, and, and, yeah. Like, cite examples like this is super helpful. Not if you're not suffering from a delusion making you think as such they're not. Yeah, and, and we're not promoting it. Yeah, you are. We're not trying to force people to be a part of it or anything like that. That's not what promoting means. We're just explaining our orientation and what it means really to be a zoophile. From a biased perspective in a narrative context that benefits you through the perpetuation of harmful misinformation and abusive practices. And I think that's what's really beautiful about this conversation that we're having. Yeah, I'm honored once again to be here and be able to talk about these things openly. I never thought, never thought I'd see the day where I could feel comfortable doing this. <laughs> it's funny because they still hide their identities. And I hope it helps others of you out there, so whether you have the same sorts of feelings as us, or you're just trying to learn more. If you have sexual inclinations towards animals, or have been sexually abused by an animal in the past, please speak openly to a therapist or somebody qualified about your feelings. Nobody wants to be a victimizer. Please take the steps to prevent that from happening, and you will have everyone's respect. Make dishonest arguments to justify that abuse and your unwillingness to seek treatment, however. Suffer the social ire and the law. I don't make the rules. I hope that we have more of a positive kind of response to this video. I know you know, normally at this point I'd like scroll through the comments and show you guys how much people hated it, but you know, the video's gone, so rip. I know that there's going to be quite a, quite a shitstorm, uh, probably caused by me publishing this sort of thing very publicly, but I do hope that people will understand, um, and maybe they're more neutral, they, they don't want to burn me on a stake, but they also maybe don't fully accept kind of my views. Um, yeah, and, and that's, that's totally fine. Um, when it comes to the laws and legal and all that, I, I really think that people should consider whether or not the animal enjoyed the interaction. Yeah, just telepathically communicate with them to determine that. It's easy. Oh wait, no, I'm sorry, that's right. We can just ask the person who abused them, because they're just so good at inherently understanding animal needs and communicating that truthfully. By this implication, if I were to sexually assault someone and I got them to come during the process, do I then get to argue that it wasn't sexual assault because they enjoyed it, because they came? Fuck off. Not just, you know, the black and white of deciding for that animal that it didn't enjoy it de facto because I said so and that sort of thing. Sure, we'll just do the exact opposite. That sounds like a reasonable approach. That's, that's kind of my view on that, and that we can't necessarily judge people's morals just from one single thing that they're into, or one aspect of themselves, you know, um... You can judge their morals on that topic, though. Like, if your morals say it's fine to fuck dogs, I don't really care what your other morals are or whether or not I agree with them, because that's the one I'm obviously taking issue with. People aren't judging all of your morals, they're judging that one and any other morals related to it. I don't give a shit if you think think animals deserve more rights if the reason you think that is so you have the right to fuck them. Yeah, I think it's okay to kill people I don't like, but you can't just judge me on that moral alone. Yes we can, bitch! Much like how you are going to inevitably label me an anti-zoo because I have morals against sexually abusing animals, I mean, you can't judge me for that alone, but I know you're going to. Isn't that what you've been doing with Coyote Lovely and his kinks on Twitter, trying to get across that he's a deplorable deplorable person who shouldn't be listened to because he has a gross fetish and that apparently makes him a hypocrite. Whoops. And that's why this might be hard for a lot of people because they're going to see, you know, they know me. They know I'm affectionate and loving and really help people and then they see, 
Oh, they're also a zoo file. <laughs> we are aware that layers of a person exist. People just take issue with this layer of your person because you promote it, yes you do, as being okay when everybody else recognizes it as sexual abuse. To such an extent that you've even created a non-profit specifically with that intention in mind. We'll get to it. And, once again, could be argued on the opposite side regarding anti-zoos. And I really hope that people don't completely judge my morality off of that single aspect of myself. And I hope they don't judge you either. I hope so too, but like you, I'm prepared for it. Absolutely. It's an eventuality that we've uh, incurred potentially, mm -hmm. and uh, risks must be taken, I believe, in order to help others, and I'm glad I took the risk that resulted in helping you out uh, get to where you are here today. Thank you. And I, I wouldn't take it back for any negative comment. <laughs> well, it was good having you here, and um, I'm sure that this has answered a lot of people's questions, gave a little bit more insight on the conversation, and maybe uh, fulfilled those cravings for some people for more information about somebody who actually practices zoophilia and has a mate. Still a really disingenuous example considering you admitted that Zoom didn't sexually engage with the animal under his care, which is what people take issue with. Also, you can't practice a paraphilia. So, yeah. yeah thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Sounds good. And that's thankfully the extent of Sappho's video. Unfortunately for us, it's not really the end of her content I'll be looking into, but everything else is very minor visually, so we can count ourselves lucky in that regard. As mentioned before, Sappho was seemingly trying to pick up where Douglas Spink ended off. Her, what I believe to have been last video before her channel was completely deleted for a period of time, was Major Announcement ZNA, explaining how she's gotten into contact with various other prominent zoo files, including members of the present day zooier than now podcast and set up what she referred to as the first zoo sexual rights organization in the United States, that being Zeta North America. Wow, gee, almost sounds like she is networking in zoophile prominent spaces or something, in the sense that Sappho is trying to push for zoophile sexual rights to abuse animals, she is pushing essentially as far as Douglas Spink planned to. The point of the Zooier Than Thou podcast episode Sappho cited to us had to do with coming out publicly as zoophiles, and a means of creating zoophilia friendly spaces in the mainstream. So Spink and Toggle were already working on the notion of having zoophiles be more open about their compulsions in online and public spaces. Sappho seems to be going the extra mile in creating that very space for them. Sappho describes ZNA as a legally incorporated 501c3 nonprofit organization with strict rules as to how money is spent, though failing to really establish any particulars beyond that. Sappho was already lying by this point as as the organization was not, in fact, considered a nonprofit, and wouldn't even be eligible for such a title until it had existed for a minimum of three years. Idiocy or malicious deception? Hard to tell when Sappho's already demonstrated an equal abundance of both. Either way, since Sappho originally described it as such and opened the organization's website up to accept donations under this provision, I could be wrong, but I'm Pretty sure any money accepted during the period of time where they claimed the organization was a nonprofit was flat out just fraud. At the very least, it was stealing. She claims that the purpose of the organization is to provide education on zoophilia. She uses zoo sexuality, I won't, and animal rights activism, all allegedly whilst not promoting the adult side, quote unquote, of zoophilia. Considering zoophilia is focused around the compulsion to sexually abuse animals, I'm kinda curious how the hell they'd pull that off. Additionally, considering we've already gone over the sources she cited here as her means of educating us on what zoophilia was and it was blatantly apparent that the sources were written by people biased in its favor and not based on any real scientific consensus, I don't exactly have much confidence in her organization's ability to be objective. Any education they would provide based on the sources Sappho herself has cited to us, we already know is going to be biased misinformation in favor of, yes, promoting zoophilia. No one's even bothered to mention that since paraphilias tend to come as sets, the zoo files they would be educating us on likely have other paraphilias that are going to cross over. So how is the organization going to address zoo files with additional budding interests in children or corpses or sexual sadism? What about zoo files who also claim to be pedophiles? Yep, that's obviously gonna come into play because of fucking course it will. Gee, it's not like that 
that's already been shown to be a big problem with zoo files or something. Sappho wants to implement her site not only as a new resource that zoo files can bring up when throwing out their own equally asinine and disingenuous arguments, but she also specifically indicates that she's taking steps to make the site particularly difficult to take down. I imagine this has everything to do with the quote unquote anti-zoo sexuality hate Sappho's been on the receiving end of, but it could also be tied to anti-zoo file activists who specifically make attempts to remove content like this from online. Praise be to them. Sappho probably also thinks her website would be safe if there's no actual bestiality porn. How long do you think it would have taken for zoo files to start exchanging pornography on that site? And of course, once again, Sappho makes the dumbass claim that the organization will not be promoting the sexual aspects of zoo sexuality, whilst also indicating that she wants to create promotional merchandise, like stickers, flags, posters, and whatnot, with the purpose of normalizing zoo sexuality, which by the very first fucking definition of promote means to elevate to a more important or accepted rank, so you are promoting it! Promote also means to urge the adoption of, as in, to urge the adoption of zoo sexuality into the category of sexualities. You absolutely stupid ass motherfucker. Like literally who thinks instances of bestiality are not going to increase the minute you tell zoo files their once hidden behaviors are now legally a-okay. Delusional people, that's who. Oh, but I was promoting the sexuality, not the act of bestiality. You're being pedantic about it at this point, shitheads. You're promoting the notion that it's okay for people to be in sexual relationships with and want to fuck animals. Bestiality is the act of fucking them, which would obviously then happen more in a world where zoophilia was normalized as a sexuality. Recognize the correlation, you delusional tit. Oh, also, if anyone's actually worried about the implications of Sappho being able to create this organization, uh, don't be. NAMBLA, also known as the North American Man-Boy Love Association, cube barfs, has been around for something like 40 years now. So yes, you can create advocacy groups centered around paraphilias, acting upon the delusions from which is a crime. Now, for anyone who worries about that prospect, again, don't. The organization being allowed to exist doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get much done with regards to furthering their cause. Again, I could basically just point you to NAMBLA and their ineffectual pleas for abolishing age of consent laws over the years. Look, let me put it this way, my anxiety makes me worry about a lot of stupid things, but I'm not losing any sleep over the notion that Sappho making an openly zoophile biased non non profit is somehow going to lead society down the slippery slope into thinking sexually abusing animals, many of whom we've domesticated over centuries, is okay. It's just not going to happen. Even my chemically confused brain recognizes that people aren't that gullible. Also, you don't have to worry about it because the organization and its organizers basically basically imploded on one another, pretty sure before the end of the year. So to my knowledge, this organization no longer even exists. Real waves Sappho was making in her community, huh? And I don't know, maybe people had reason to be concerned with Sappho's methods, both those apparent and unseen, considering she was interacting with and talking about zoo sexual pride with literal minors. Remember earlier when I mentioned the problem of zoophiles grooming children into their community? who were not actually zoophiles and who had come to realize that years later after they had worked through the trauma. Hi TikTok, I'm here with Sappho. And we wanted to say happy, happy zoo furry pride. pride. <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> the kid in the video? 14. Yeah, weird. Almost like there's a pattern of victimizing those susceptible. Took me forever to actually get this video finished, so nobody will be shocked when I tell you that it has since come out that Sappho was indeed basically grooming this child into being a zoophile. On top of many, many other things. Before we get into that too deeply, however, I want to perform a little test for the sake of proving a point. Okay, so I want everyone who, as a child, had a crush on Kovu from The Lion King 2 Simba's Pride to please raise their hands. It's okay, don't be shy. Get them way up high there so I can see all of you. Awesome, okay, cool, thank you. Okay, next. Anyone who had a crush on one or more of any member of Elvin and the Chipmunks or the Chipettes? 
Yep, that's about what I thought. Okay, good, good. Hands back down. What about an animal character from a Don Bluth movie? Okay, yeah, all right. The flashy, abnormally large mouse? Yep, this is about it. Okay, how about a Pokemon? Doesn't have to be a specific one. We already know Smasher Pass is a thing, bitches. Yep, okay, there it is, checks out. So why am I asking all of this? Well, not only to demonstrate that crushes on fictional cartoon anthropomorphized animal characters is actually quite common, to my knowledge, potentially more in children, but I would have to double check on that, but also to point out that this is usually how zoophiles groom children, from what I understand, through fictional anthropomorphized media. Not to say stuff like this is bad, it's not. It's just that manipulative people can turn positive things against you. The same comics that might be used to help heal a victim's trauma might also be something that a monster uses to lure in their next victim. It doesn't mean the media itself is bad, it means that it was used by a bad person. Now, for people who understand how anthropomorphizing works, you probably already have an idea of how this works. For everybody else, lucky you got me! Anthropomorphize means to attribute human characters characteristics or behavior to, and that thing can be anything from a concept, to an object, to an animal. Anthropomorphizing can come across in a wide array of forms, for example, in very minimal ways, like, say, the animals in Babe movies. I don't know how much this is dating me, but when I was younger I remember loving to watch a Babe movie where the animals talked, but only in the sense that a camera filmed animals doing, like, regular old animal things, and then voice actors dubbed a story over it. The imposing of human values, voice reasoning, and personality helps us to relate to the character a little more like how we would another human, rather than a member of another species. Not in that people suddenly become directly attracted to them, please don't misconstrue that, but in that we can form a more established parasocial relationship with the fictional character created. Now, that's just the most basic way you can anthropomorphize something, by putting human voices over literal physical things. But once you open up the door to visual drawing mediums, all hell breaks loose. Anthropomorphizing in cartoons can display their subjects in a wide variety of physical designs while still getting across to us that we are looking at that subject. A lot of that has to do with how the human brain perceives information. What we are looking at on screen isn't real. They aren't real creatures, they aren't living things. But by arranging the lines that make them up in just the right way, we can trick our brains into thinking that they are. Or at the very at the very least, allowing them to act as a reasonable stand-in for the real-life thing. And in this sense, the characters that we are being tricked into thinking are more real than they are, are heavily anthropomorphized versions of animal characters, in that they are a collection of lines that we are convincing the brain is an animal, whilst also applying a variety of human traits that distinctly separate the character from being an actual animal. Like a big old characterization contradiction. Prediction. Obviously, anthropomorphizing applies to other things, but we're just gonna focus on animal characters from this point on. Just have that little asterisk in your head about it. Remember guys, anthropomorphized animals are not real animals. Unless it's like the Babe movie I mentioned before, and media similar to that. I'm pretty sure there's a movie about a dog and a cat who get lost and they're like, they're dubbed over, right? Also a good example, wish I'd actually watched that movie and knew what it was called. Typically, anthropomorphized cartoon animals apply not just human personality, traits, but also human visual traits onto animals. They make them walk upright, even in instances where they probably physically couldn't. They make the eyes big and bulgy and childlike so they're cute and relatable. They give them human teeth, which is usually terrifying if done in real life. Like this thing is not a fucking pony, but Hasbro sold it to us as one because they designed it in a way to trick you into thinking it could be a pony. Not a literal pony, but an abstract mental construct that you associate with ponies, which then gets confirmed when they constantly within the show tell you that it's supposed to be a pony. Hasbro really went like, hey, this Technicolor four-legged bobblehead, it's a pony. And we were just like, sounds about right, mate. Sure, all the bronies wanted to hump the drawings, but they didn't all then go out to screw literal horses. To further prove this point, I went to my Twitter and directly asked peeps what their animated animal crushes were. And they had plenty to share. None of which meant any of these people were attracted to real animals. Why? Because all of these characters are fictional, anthropomorphized animal characters that are used as larger parts of narrative stories we 
are told as children. The characters not only represent aspects, concepts, and ideals within the stories, they represent different things to each of us individually, not just in their designs, but in their personalities and functions as characters. It's my function! Shout out to anyone who started crushing on appliances. What do we got here? Gil from Finding Nemo? Specific attraction coming from Willem Dafoe's voice? Yeah, that checks out. Wan Shi Tong from Avatar The Last Airbender? Also got themselves a sexy voice. And they're a reclusive, intensely intelligent knowledge seeker? I also approve. Spirit? Yeah, that movie was a horse girl's dream. Extinct animals from Ice Age and Dinosaur? Oh, careful guys. Much prehistoric predator. <laughs> that begs the question, if a zoophile is attracted to exclusively extinct animals, Animals. Is their fixation an issue in the modern day if they don't act upon living animals? Strange discussion topic for you comment section that. peeps. The Balto dogs. Yeah, I don't know why that didn't immediately come to mind. That seems like a what big one. Do? Madagascar animals, over the hedge, Eeyore, the rescuers, a hillbilly firefly, either Duchess or O'Malley from the Aristocats. That checks out. Feel like if I was more of a cat person, they could have gotten me too. Charlie from All Dogs Go to Heaven. Oh, hell yeah. And and that movie even had a little girl character that Charlie cares for that a bunch of kids could have projected themselves onto. Wow, the world's wild when psychology is an option. Point is, absolutely none of these people identify as a zoophile, to my knowledge, nor do these childhood crushes mean that any of them want to bed literal animals. They're just harmless crushes on anthropomorphized talking lines and colors on a screen. We grow up with these characters and they help to shape us, which is why it's then so frustrating to know that bad faith actors will try to use a person's natural attraction to fictional conceptual characters as a means of convincing them a paraphilia is actually their sexuality. What, you want mine to use against me in the future? Sure thing, buddy. I'll make it easy for you. Some of mine included the turtle from the Swan Princess, the clumsy crow from the Secret of Nim. I know everybody else was into the rats. A bunch of bats ranging from paranoid bitch baby to femme protagonist to suave villain, and a a flamboyant French bird. And if we stray from animals, include the vacuum from the Brave Little Toaster because Thurl Ravencroft's voice did things to me. And that was only with regards to non-typical furry-esque characters, as in ones that still had a pretty obvious animal design to them. Once you open the floodgate to furry rules, the pool just gets bigger and bigger. Almost like people are attracted to the human traits portrayed in these fictional characters, not the animal ones that Sappho and other zoophiles might hyper-focus on. Even CGI animals or real animals with voices dubbed over them, I'm sure it could be argued that there is sufficient anthropomorphizing going on that a person developing a crush on said character wouldn't constitute as a person being attracted to an animal in a constant sense, I guess. I'm not entirely sure. Plus, childhood crushes are predominantly, like, non-sexual in nature, at least when they start. I don't know about you guys, but while I'd have crushes as a kid, they definitely weren't sexual for a long time. And the Anthropomorphized animal characters in these instances can talk and reason like actual human beings anyways, so all of the reservations we have that would tie into Sappho's case already don't apply here. Sappho's friend's dog can't say no. Aslan can. If you want to know more, talk to a psychology researcher about the specifics, I guess. At the end of the day, there's a huge difference between having a crush on wisecracking, talking, fictional cartoon dog Charlie Barkin and having a crush on an actual actual barking flesh and blood German Shepherd. Anyways, uh, that's how they get them. The zoophile is getting the kids they groom, I mean, and the narrative they use to do so. Or it's one way. I assume there would be multiple methods, but this is the one I feel I'm knowledgeable enough to explain, you know, because art. Liking anthropomorphized characters doesn't make a person a zoophile. And sure, I might know that being an adult, but a kid might not understand that distinction. A kid might think that because they liked the curvy kitty from Cats Don't Dance, or because they developed a crush on Dark Patch Twinkle Paw or whatever from Warrior Cats books, that means they're attracted to literal cats. And you know what? Chances are they're more likely to make that connection if someone is directly putting it across to them and telling them that being attracted to 
animals is an oppressed sexuality. Like maybe they're big internet mommy senpai. Because as I've seen, kids will conflate fictional characters with real life because they are both inexperienced in life and think they know everything. There is a huge difference between developing a crush or even just a flat out sexual fascination with a fictional anthropomorphized non-human character versus a crush on a literal flesh and blood dog. But again, a child might not understand that distinction. Sappho, I can only assume in an attempt to effectively run from the suspicions people have that she is grooming these children into zoophilia, has since changed her discord to be 18 plus. That's assuming it even still exists. It's been a while since I touched the script. Aw, now how are we supposed to learn about the non-sexual side of zoosexuality? Because of this, guys, preemptive note, chances are most children you come across who are wrapped up in the zoo community, yeah, they probably aren't actually zoophiles and they've just been groomed into it. Or at the very least, they could be young enough that the paraphilia is early set and they can be preemptively treated with appropriate therapy. Keep that in mind if ever you interact with them. Don't treat them like the bad guys. It'll just reinforce what these older zoophiles have told them and it will drive them further into this instilled delusion. So maybe just like, don't interact with them. In fact, yeah, if you're not a therapist or someone in a profession trained to communicate with at-risk children, specifically go out of your way to avoid these kids. Because chances are you're not going to help by venting your disgust of zoophilia in DMs to them. Harassing these kids will just worsen the problem. Anyone who claims they're helping a child by sending them harassment and death threats are deluding themselves just as much as these zoophiles are. You're the bad guy. Duh. What probably makes this habit of people venting their frustration at possible victims of zoophilic grooming even more troubling is that when those children do finally manage to break out of this instilled delusion and declare themselves as not having been zoophiles in the first place, they are then mocked by the wider zoophile community because they are just cowing to the whims of the zoophobic masses. So not only are these children ridiculed by the side that should be encouraging them to seek help, they're also then berated by other zoophiles for no longer believing themselves to be zoophiles. Almost like the zoophiles are more concerned with strengthening their numbers as a means of seeming more legitimate, rather than allowing people to recognize and come to a healthy realization about their sexuality on their own. Gee, that almost sounds like a system designed to pull them straight back into the community. Weird! I would also like to take this opportunity to point out something that is extremely troubling, and this is especially directly directed towards the children in my audience. After Sappho was exposed as having allegedly groomed the 14 year old I discussed earlier, it was also revealed that a group of children ranging in ages from nine to 14 joined Sappho's discord with the intent of exposing her. Those children became enraptured by Sappho and for a long time were also convinced that they were zoophiles. I bring this up because I want to point out exactly how manipulative people like this can be and how damaging it can be in particular to those who are young or susceptible. And I know some children are going to hear this and think to themselves, oh, but I'm smarter than those kids. I would never be tricked like that. But you have to remember, these kids were also very much aware that Sappho was a zoophile and going in, they were presumably also aware that zoophilia is not a sexuality. They were still sucked in. That doesn't say anything negative about them as the victims, but it it does say a lot about how capable Sappho is in convincing her detractors of her side. At least in private, where she can sexually manipulate people in her big dumb dog mom role. Big dumb dog mom. Oh my god, that's hard to say. Obviously, that hasn't worked as well for her in public spaces. We should be discouraging kids from getting involved in situations like this. If you hear that a creator you know of or like is a predator, do not throw yourselves into the fray as a means of proving or disproving this notion. You are essentially throwing yourself right into the pathway of the very danger the adults want you to stay away from. And you are doing so completely unaware of what that danger entails. Guaranteed, most of these kids went into Sappho's Discord thinking there was never the possibility they would ever get suckered into her narrative. They wouldn't have even considered it as an option, either from ignorance of the possibility or naive overconfidence in their own abilities. Please, please, 
please, if you are a kid, stay away from people like this. Don't try to help the adults by putting yourself in danger. Any adult that would ask that of you or encourage that from you is in the wrong. What the heck was I talking about? Right, what happened after Sappho was revealed to have basically been grooming the child that they were openly promoting to the world as an example of how child zoophiles can be introduced into their sexuality in a healthy way? Uh, duh, they were outed as a map. Sappho oh so eloquently dances around this by claiming attraction to people under the age of 16. La gasp, so much shock, I am shooketh to my core, for never could I have seen this coming. I got distracted from Sappho's antics just before December, and that also happens to be when a lot of very crazy shit happened in a very short amount of time, so I'll try to make it as cohesive as possible. December 3rd rolls around and Sappho tweets about a 14 year old named Julia, who according to Sappho, took her own life as a result of anti-zoo harassment and bullying. Now, keep in mind, Sappho doesn't provide anything to prove that this Julia person had taken her own life, let alone that she had ever actually existed. Despite that, she propped the memory of this Julia character up as a martyr, someone whom she'd supposedly been crying over the demise of, and was seemingly so close to that she would be attending her funeral. That didn't happen, by the way. Sappho, Just yesterday you apologized to me for bothering me, that you thought I was a cool person and that you liked my voice, and I didn't respond. There is a reason we are doing what we are doing to stop the harassment and bullying that leads to this. Julia, rest well now. Attached was a message to a user named Julia something, sort of indicating that she was dead. Sappho continues, I stopped sobbing and drinking. I just really hope in the future this can be prevented with more resources. I have nothing to gain from my mourning, and you assholes are sick for trivializing a child's death or insinuating it's some fake stunt. You you constantly tell zoos to kill themselves, and look what happened. Are you proud? Do you feel accomplished? Feel good for literally causing the death of a child? It's literally your hate and bigotry that caused this. That's why we need broader social support. Honestly, you people make me sick, and you have the audacity to act like I'm the one with issues. Take a look in the mirror and think real long and hard about the harm you cause to others. I only wish I could have helped them. It hurts me deeply that they are gone. Reflect. I'm going to be attending Julia's funeral. To the people still saying it's fake or my fault somehow, fuck, fuck you. you. I cared about them. They felt motivated, happy, and accepted for the fact they have people to talk to about their feelings. And then antis ended up causing their death. But they're going to blame me. How is this not the most reprehensible shit anyone has ever seen? How is this not gaslighting? I am clearly mourning and grieving, and you cunts won't stop. I wish every single one of you very quick and decisive karma. Maybe the problem is society in general treating people like less than human for having an undesirable trait. These people lack the ability to understand if this was happening half a century ago, they would be saying the same thing if it happened to be about gay rights. Well, Antis, you've done it. You've given me a lifetime of motivation to work hard for the rights of Zeus sexuals. You've given me the motivation to continue motivating and inspiring others, including hopefully the formation of youth groups. Cope, seethe, and cry about it. Your hate and bigotry has no place in this world, and you all deserve very painful karma coming your way and the hardships you experience in life, antis. Attractions develop around puberty. Zoo sexuality is no different. Nobody is being groomed into being one. You disgusting, hateful fucks would have said the same of other marginalized groups like gay people when it was convenient slash society treated them as a mental illness. The fact you have so much cognitive dissonance and lack critical thinking is something truly astonishing. Not the most basic capacity to think, hmm, maybe we are the horrible, hateful people telling others to kill themselves. Maybe treating others like subhumans is not okay. This time your actions are being immortalized for all time. Humans will be absolutely fucking disgusted by your vile behavior and how you treat non-humans within the next century. Hopefully your shitty behavior is never forgotten. You deserve to have that class would hang over you. Three days later, it came out that Julia was a real person, she was not dead, and was in fact alive. Sappho's response? Oh well, we don't know if it's really her, the account could have been compromised. I'm sorry. So you're immediately willing, without evidence, to believe that Julia had taken her own life, but your response to then seeing activity on the account claiming this to be untrue is, okay, but maybe hackers. What? 
generally this happens the opposite way around. Not in that you automatically assume hackers, but in that you're generally less likely to believe the more extreme thing. In this case, the more extreme thing would be Julia's alleged not aliving. Julia then went on to prove that it was in fact her and that she was in fact still alive. I mean, it was a video of her dog, but still. Sappho's response? Literally never address it again and never correct the video thread don't propping care. Julia up as a zoophilic care. martyr. Fucking care. brilliant. Now this is where things get really dark really fast. See, a different account that you might recognize called Your Cat's Baby Mama and going by the name Serval was both a friend of Julia's and an avid fan of Sappho. Upon hearing from their idol that Julia had taken her own life and that the Julia on the account trying to contact them was a bad faith hacker, Serval made the very unfortunate decision to post their full address on TikTok and ask for someone to come and eliminate them. When Julia tried to contact Serval, obviously scared for their friend, Serval pretended to be deceased. <laughs> Presumably out of fear or paranoia or maybe spurred to lie for some other reason. Allegedly a wellness check was performed instead and Serval was checked in on police, but like that's really scary, come on. Now obviously I can't say that Sappho is responsible for Serval's detrimental choice, but Sappho is responsible for feeding Serval the traumatizing misinformation that would then lead to those decisions. Sappho was then responsible for continuing continuing that by being the one falsely claiming that Julia's account was somehow compromised and that it simply wasn't more likely that a 14 year old had lied about their not aliving process online. Like gee, we've never seen that before. This would have covered December 3rd to 12th. Come December 13th and Sappho's actions start to appear like the progressive unraveling of a mentally unwell person. See, what some people weren't aware of was that back on December 1st, someone had released a segment of a conversation that appeared to have Sappho defending the concept of minors consenting to have sex with adults. A child still does not have the mental capacity to go through with um, safely. Um, okay, so that, that very last part I... I disagree with. People had been partially distracted with the alleged death of Julia when this clip first popped up, but now that things had calmed down on the fake death front, people started taking notice of this audio clip, and Sappho responded exactly how one would have expected. Please note, I transcribed this whole Twitter thread at the time that I saw it, but I might not be able to get my hands on the screenshots of it at this point, what with her Twitter being defunct and all that jazz, so take it as you will. Sappho's Twitter thread. <coughs> <clears throat> Trigger warning. Possibly offensive opinion, mostly to aunties. I have been asked a lot about what my personal opinion is on maps and whether I am one or not. I want to have a nuanced thread on the topic because I do think it is important to talk about at least. Map, minor attracted person, is a weird term and not very well defined in my opinion. I think the main issue is that it encompasses too large a group of people. Like the ones that are attracted to prepubescent children and those that are attracted to teens, i.e after puberty. While as zoosexuals, we can have very clear and defined boundaries, it's a lot harder for maps. For us zoos, it's like walking on pebbles, but for them, it's like walking on razors because there is so much extra responsibility in the matter, stigma, and potential for abuse. The United States is very Puritan and has a view on sex that is very icky, ew, historically, and 18 being some magic number basically takes the responsibility off legislatures to actually make nuance laws and just say, well, you can agree to a contract so you can consent. I find myself in agreement with Vox on this, that individuals within a certain age range should be able to give consent or a weaker version of consent that puts extra responsibility on the older person to not abuse or maliciously influence a minor. At its strictest, I agree with Florida's interpretation, which is that someone 16 to 17 can consent to an adult up to 23. At loosest, I believe Swiggle 16 should be the age of consent plus 
extra considerations for people that are close in age, Romeo and Juliet laws. Many states in the US are actually like this, and 16 is the age of consent. And essentially every country in Europe, bar three from 1718, have age of consent as between 14 to 16. And a surprising number have it set at 14. In Canada and Russia, it's also 16, plus close in age laws. My problem with terms that get thrown around a lot like groomer and pedo is that they are used completely improperly and assume abuse regardless of those considerations. Someone can be 17 and 364 days old, but God forbid an adult loves them because then they're a pedo groomer. Within strict boundaries, love is love, and if true love is there, then someone can wait for the sexual stuff, and there can be a completely healthy, nurturing, and guiding relationship without that, in my opinion. I believe it should be the same online as well, but laws are slow to catch up. Intentions need to be considered. Consent needed to be at the forefront. Extra responsibility to the adult. Manipulation needs to be considered. Is there actual love or is it just sexual manipulation? There should be no abuse or pressure or any real pornography involved, etc. I am saying all of this knowing of no maps that certain people have talked to me about that have not abused and are definitely not no maps. I am also saying this as someone who was a teleophile since 13, attracted to adults and significantly older people. Sidebar on that, I'm pretty sure being diagnosed as a teleophile is similar to being diagnosed as a pedophile in that you can only really be diagnosed when you're at least 16 years of age, but also being attracted to people older than you and thus more sexually mature is fucking normal. Get over yourself. I am attracted to some, but minors specifically, no. In fact, my most recent partners were significantly older. I do not know if I would call myself a map. If so, then it's more like layers of an onion than yes slash no. I am mostly just a loving, guiding, nurturing motherly figure. Ultimately, my message to minors in the community and in general is to be seriously careful and considerate and to emphasize safety. A real groomer is usually going to be subtle and calculated. Try pressuring or blackmailing you to get sexual things from you, etc. If you are being abused or pressured sexually by an adult, report it. Call cyber tip, blah blah blah. Come up with your own determinations and think critically for yourself. Question tradition and the bandwagon fallacy. The ones that are not intellectually dishonest might actually do that and not declare me a map by virtue of purple dragon bad. Ah yes, put a good chunk of the responsibility to not be victimized on the very people who are supposed to be protected because they are more likely to be victimized because they can't objectively analyze a situation in the fashion that she is encouraging them to. This is like saying, come on dog, you were abused, so speak up about it. Speak up for yourself and don't let them get away with it. That's what she's doing here. She's figuratively looking at these kids and telling them to stop being so easily victimized. Just grow up and get good, scrub. And that's even outside of the fact that she's fucking wrong in that this is generally how groomers act. Sappho puts out the notion that groomers are sexually aggressive and will instantly pressure their victims or resort to blackmail when, in actuality, they're often way more subtle and nefarious and slow in their process. They will befriend their victims and worm their way into their lives as something of a trustworthy figure. They will make themselves someone that the victim may turn to or rely on in times of need. Sure, blackmail is is one thing that they might do, but it's not the default like Sappho would have you believe, and it will become apparent as to why Sappho specifically tries to get us to view groomers in this very specific way as we move forward, namely in that it's not the method that she used. At this same time, Sappho had created a not safe for work Twitter account, which was openly posting links to pornography with tags that she outright identified as being kinks that she was into. Nobody will be shocked to learn that those tags included cub, a furry community term used to refer to depictions of what are supposed to be read as child characters. Miners. This not safe for work Twitter account was completely open and so a slew of underage children from Sappho's community then flocked to her porn account and were not promptly yeeted from that follower count, almost like Sappho wasn't concerned with whether or not minors were looking at her kink content. One day later on December 14th, Sappho would publicly come out as being attracted to underage individuals, self-identifying as a map or minor attracted person. You may have noticed 
notice that I now have the U. I don't actually know what the U symbol is supposed to mean. We'll just say it means underage. The underage symbol in my usernames and might wonder what that means. Essentially, strictly speaking, I am what would be referred to as a map. I want to clarify that this is rather technical as I am personally attracted to some people, Swiggle 16 to 18. That little Swiggle she's constantly including before the 16, that means younger or less than. So she's trying to sugarcoat it by saying that she's attracted to people around the ages of 16 to 18, which would seem not that bad if you're aware that she herself was around 20 to 22, but then dog whistles to indicate to those who know the meaning of the symbol that she also has sexual preferences for those under the age of 16. Still think we should be referring to Toggle's expertise, Sappho? Sappho's Twitter account was deleted within two days of this announcement, roughly around December 15th or 16th, because I guess even Twitter had decided that this was going too far. Then, right as she seemed to be gloating about how the trolls would never fully win against her, her not safe for work Twitter account was banned as well. But that didn't stop Sappho from trying to rile her community together, this time under the banner of a Mastodon server, one which she had so lovingly titled Zetamoo.club. This new server would be Sappho's latest attempt to create an interconnected community after the manipulative YouTube coming out video had failed, then after the Zeta North America project failed, and then after her Twitter spaces failed. Apparently, she can't seem to get it in her thick skull that not long after she exposes herself as a child-loving zoophile, she gets booted from the spaces that allow her not only access to her child victims, but also a platform to advocate for animal sex. Not exactly the sharpest knife in the drawer, but hey, I guess it works for us. So so guess what happened on December 19th? If you guessed she was revealed to have been grooming a 16 year old kid, then ding 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 you'd be correct. See, while Sappho's Twitter account was still up, she had been interacting with a user named Kylo, and having now come out as someone purportedly attracted to people around the age of Kylo's exact age, people started to raise some brows. Of course, Sappho tried to dissuade her critics by claiming that her relationship with Kylo was purely platonic and motherly, but people were also already aware that Sappho had a mommy kink. So, for as disturbing as it was, it came as no surprise when a leaked conversation between a third party and Kylo showed Kylo admit that he and Sappho were in a relationship, something that Sappho wasn't too happy about him doing. After this leak, Kylo took to the Zeta Moo Club server to try and convince everyone that the rumors about him and Sappho were actually untrue. Despite this, however, on December 21st, Kylo admitted that yes, he and Sappho had been dating and he revealed screenshots of a conversation from December 20th of him breaking things off with Sappho and her trying to guilt him into not breaking communication with implications of her harming herself. Self. According to Kylo, he initially lied to keep himself safe, which actually makes a lot of sense given that he was attached to a hot button subject in the community at the time, and he probably had no intention of being dragged the way that Sappho was. Kylo would also post conversations between him and another user named Becca, who had earlier attempted to act as a red herring claiming that she was actually the one dating Sappho, not Kylo. Becca was now angry that Kylo had revealed the truth, and during this screenshot dump, Kylo revealed that upon Sappho's request, the two of them had shared pictures, which means that there may now be confirmation from one of her victims that Sappho was soliciting inappropriate images of minors. By December 22nd, Sappho was posting in her Zetamu Club safe space saying, Hey, so don't be concerned, but I'm going to be in a psych ward for some time. I'm not sure when I'll be back. The mental health people are pretty concerned though. So goodbye for now. I'll be back sometime. Don't worry about me. I'm getting the help I need. Love you all, Valerie. Also, fuck Kyle. I definitely fell in love with the wrong person and now they are purposely trying to hurt me out of spite. I cared for them and literally bought them fucking food because their bio mother was too much of a piece of shit to get him any, among other things. They are definitely stretching things to put me in a worse light. They did not need to throw me under a bus to break things off, but chose to massively publicize it. And for what? They never actually loved me or cared, so fuck you, Kai. I'm sorry, Sappho. So is this you admitting that when this child was in a bad spot and according to you had a neglectful parent, you overstepped boundaries to provide for him? That thing that groomers do to establish a personal connection with their victims? Victims who are usually neglected kids? This isn't even close to the last time that Sappho would talk about Kylo. For the next few days, Sappho went on a tirade against the ex-victim, both directly speaking to her community about him and seemingly 
started tagging or else responding to him directly within the server. Sorry, I don't know if it was anything more specific than that. I'm not super familiar with how Mastodon servers work. I'm not gonna read these aloud because frankly, Sappho molding over the fact that she can't emotionally manipulate a child anymore while still trying to guilt him into giving her a response is phenomenally pathetic and cringe inducing. Especially when you take into consideration that interspersed between the Kylo tirades was Sappho claiming to currently be posting out of a psych ward, which she claims was possible because she had occasional access to her phone and internet. These claims would also be reflected in posts over on her YouTube account. So she's trying to tell us that she's getting help and would never do things like this again, whilst bitching endlessly about how she was called out to such a point that she purportedly had to seek medical attention? Yeah, real shocker here, but I don't exactly buy it. Despite that, on December 30th, it was revealed on Twitter that Sappho was present in a paraphilia recovery group on Discord, which is a step, a step that didn't go very far and probably had a giant foot-breaking crack in it because she was banned from that very server a day after her presence there was announced by the owner because she was using the same love-bombing bullshit garbage that got people wary of her in the first place. Despite having already leaked a masked picture of herself on November 29th on Twitter, Sappho purportedly felt so safe in her little zoo-centric server that she leaked a full non-masked picture of herself. That, however, was potentially only one of many oversights on her part, as Mastodon itself disabled access to the Zetamu Club server on January 6th, one day after Sappho herself claimed that she would be disabling the server, because the tech whiz that is Sappho screwed up so badly in the creation of the space that it was apparently rife with easily accessible, usable holes. In hindsight, probably something that Sappho would have otherwise enjoyed, which allowed trolls to grab member IP addresses, which is probably why I even have this picture of her. Whoops. A quarantine has been placed on Zetamu.club. No private or DM posts will be sent to users on the instance. This instance is not safe. It is using the Google Register Cloudflare DDoS protection, breaks federation and logs IPs, is most likely run on Google Cloud Platform, the worst place you could use, is run by someone who doesn't seem to have much understanding of security and administration, and at the same time is a major target. If anyone that you care about is on that instance, please recommend them to move elsewhere almost any other instance is safer. That's pretty sad in a pathetic sort of way. She made another that Mastodon server right after crazy. this, by the way. On January 20th of 2022, a recording of Sappho back on VR chat was released and it's, I mean, well, if you thought that her alleged mental ward stay was at all helping in her addressing the things that she'd done, uh... Since I haven't actually done anything, Technically, I, I haven't, like, committed a crime. I just say I... I'm a zoophile, and also I'm a map, so... Yeah, whatever. I look at artwork. Okay, so one day after Sappho was revealed to still be lurking around her previous hunting grounds on VR chat, her original Hypnotist Sappho YouTube account was terminated, and the Mastodon server she'd previously run now redirected to a page titled Sappho.rip, where she explained that this would be the end of the Sappho branding across all of her social medias. Basically, she had decided that the Hypnotist Sappho name had accumulated so much heat and vitriol from the wider community that the branding was completely irreparable. So she was just going to ditch it for something shiny and new. If anything, the swiftness of this action should demonstrate that, by this point, Sappho was very much keeping tabs on those who were keeping tabs on her. And once it was revealed that she was making attempts to slink back into her comfort zone, she nuked everything. Sappho had obviously come to the realization that she couldn't salvage what she'd built in the wider community and would just have to start from scratch. Behind the scenes, however, Sappho was likely still in contact with a bunch of those whom she would have considered to be in her inner circle, as reports of people having private conversations with Sappho leading up to her new accounts being outed have been cropping up all year. February 20th, Sappho makes an Instagram post claiming that she's no longer a map or a zoo file. That's two months, maybe less, of her being in a psych ward, and according to her, they've cured her of her paraphilias. Well, gee, with that level of turnaround, one would think it's ridiculous that people don't immediately turn to medical help. I mean, unless of course she was lying. After this point, Sappho made multiple updates to the Sappho.rip website, none of which are anything really of note. It was mostly just her screaming into the void, nah, nah, the police haven't arrested me yet, and I'm never coming back, neener, neener, neener. 
She even purportedly went to Kiwi Farms herself to antagonize the farmers, which I've literally never heard of an instance where that worked out for someone, but whatever, go off, sis. I guess. As I mentioned earlier, Sappho's alt accounts have been progressively exposed all year, basically confirming that she was still lurking around. One of the most recent accounts exposed was the Chaotic Joan Twitter account by the YouTuber Lanza. They've got a whole timeline video about what Sappho was up to all year, and I'll provide a link to that in the description for those interested. Lanza was, to my knowledge, actually following Sappho's actions for a good chunk of the year through Kiwi Farms and other anonymous sources, so I would definitely recommend giving it a watch if you're interested. So now we cut to more recent months. The original Hypnotist Sappho account came back for a period and was rebranded to VR Hypnosis, now with a much stronger emphasis on the hypnosis aspect of her previous brand, and less so on the zoophile part. You can tell this is the original account not only because the about page says it was created September 19th, 2015, but also because some of Sappho's older videos, those being the ones that were up before she made her coming out video, are still present on the channel. Nowadays, the most recent recent video content she put up is the video Past, Present, Future, where she essentially confirms that she did lie in that February 20th Instagram post and still suffers from her paraphilias, but that she was choosing not to kick the hornet's nest and continue with her activism. She claims that while she has dated teens, she never solicited nudes from them and that the debate on this is mostly cultural. So indirectly calling Kylo a liar, almost all the rest of the video is basically just her woe is meing over the fact that the Sappho brand is basically tarnished beyond repair. In the second video, About My Views, to Joe Panda and Coyote Lovely, she essentially tried to pull a gotcha on two of her more outspoken critics. They're both pretty, uh, well, let's just say that if I was really desperate for content, I could always default to either of these videos as commentary material. What really interests me about this channel nowadays is the latest community post, as well as the tie-in post on one of her confirmed to have been Sappho alt Twitter accounts. On August 6th, 2022, Sappho posted, It was nice knowing you all. I think my time is up, unfortunately. I'm sorry I have to move on. My opinions have changed. I was 20 for God's sake at the time I dated a 16 year old and it was legal for the both of us. The grooming allegations have never ever been proven true as I have not been so much as contacted by law enforcement. I do not advocate for zoophilia even if in the past I had. I grew up and recognized my mistake on that. I dated a 16 year old and foolishly called myself a map in the past which I no longer believe in whatsoever. I have been labeled with so many harmful accusations that are untrue. Do I even need to point out that a good chunk of those accusations stemmed from Sappho herself calling herself a minor attracted person? I have been banned from the last social outlet I had. For a time, I thought maybe I could move on and have a second chance. I was hopeful with Neos, as it was labeled as a place for second chances, where you would not be banned on allegations, but whether or not you hurt others and violate rules. But this was untrue. I no longer have anywhere to go, and my time is truly over. I have nothing to live for anymore. I'm going to end things tonight. I know this may come as a shock, and I apologize to my family, and everyone that I know are going to hurt very badly from this. In the end, it looks like Kiwi Farms, the embezzlements, and others win against me. I tried so hard, I really did. I've been on medications, spent time in a psych ward, have been in therapy for so long. I was a former active duty airman. I wanted to spend my life loving and helping others. That's why I got into hypnosis. That's why I tried to matter what to give love to everyone that needed it. I'm sorry, don't feel bad. I know why it had to be done, but I hope it was worth someone's life, Neos, Kiwi Farms, Kyle, last name, others. I'm grabbing my shotgun, driving off, and I'll probably be gone tonight. I love you all, and thank you to everyone who supported and loved me through the years. Keep me alive in your memories. Yours truly, Valerie. You may have noticed that Sappho continued to reference something called Neos, and that specifically has to do with Neos VR, a metaverse similar to VR chat. Sappho was caught on there, which you can actually find on her at Chaotic Joan Twitter account because she directly responded to the person called calling attention to her presence on the platform. So you know it bothered her. So what I can surmise from this is that Sappho was exposed in the midst of her rebrand on Neos VR. According to this user, she was banned on August 7th, and this post was put up just before that on the 6th which means that this post was made like right after she was found on Neos VR. Two days later on August 8th, 2022, the Twitter account at HypnotistVal put out this tweet. 
Hello, everyone reading this. This is Valerie's partner. I'm sorry to say this, but Saturday morning she killed herself. No info will be held in the public for safety issues for her family and loved ones. I'm sorry to anyone that was close to her. Please do not contact this account. Just for the record, I checked. August 6th did indeed fall on a Saturday. So at the end of the day, is Sappho still with us in the land of the living? Did Sappho take her own life? My stance on the matter? <laughs> No, she is not dead. I had this whole thing written about how I don't believe she's dead personally because she's a chronic fucking liar and she's lied at every turn so far. So of course I don't believe an alleged suicide from someone who's already demonstrated. They're more than willing to emotionally manipulate a 16 year old with passive implications of self harm. I go to her page today to screenshot shit and lo and behold, the bitch is still fucking alive. So I was right, she faked the suicide suicide fuck you. She says within the post that she's getting more specialized help, but this is within the post where she's revealing to us that she faked her fucking suicide. Why should we believe her? Oh my god, I think I'm gonna have a stroke. Well, that was a nightmare? I think we can all count ourselves lucky that I plan to never again make a video of this length on a topic this mentally exhausting and disturbing. Since coming back, Valerie has been, according to her, sufficiently pissed off by the coverage and criticism she's been receiving, and has since scrubbed not only those newer videos from her original channel, but also most of the relevant community posts. Despite now, multiple times, saying that she would be removing herself from the internet, presumably both for her safety and the safety of others, she has recently relocated to the channel Glowing Brightly, which is supposed to focus on sticking it to the feds and keeping up with cybersecurity. A self-admitted zoophile who makes a habit of engaging inappropriately with minors behind closed doors from over the web, purposely upping security around her and throwing a middle finger to the government organization that would likely keep tabs on her actions. Oh yeah, never could have seen that coming. Couldn't imagine that being an issue in the future. She's also come out to say that the hypnotist Val Twitter account was never her, nor was it connected to her, which I would be more inclined to believe had Sappho not already proven herself to be a liar and had the Twitter not been tweeting things that seemed to match up with Sappho's public statements at the time. The main thing probably working in her favor in that regard is the fact that the Twitter was made and started posting around August 5th, except I also happen to think it would be super convenient for a completely unrelated Twitter posing as Sappho that would go on to corroborate her suicide claim being started the day right before she would even make that claim. That's shockingly well-timed if Sappho were telling the truth. And if you guess that the zoophile weirdly preoccupied with young teens who's proven herself to be a liar, claiming to be getting help and then claiming to be cured in ludicrously unbelievable record time, who just can't stay away from vulnerable groups, would go right back to her comfort zone upon her return, good job, you get a cookie. After seething about the commentary videos made about her, Sappho dropped a bunch of links into her community tab where her audience could contact her and put out a now also deleted video discussing how to hide your identity online. Nobody is shocked as to why Sappho would have an interest in that. I'll provide a link to another Lanza video in the description going over what happened in that new Discord group full of minors. Yes, it's just as bad as you expect it to be. Oh, and people proper figured out what her legal name was since then, because you know, top-notch internet security tactics. Not exactly sure if Valerie is the one you want to be taking advice from on that. On top of being a rabid liar, Sappho's kind of shown that she can't stay away from the internet for long, so anytime she says she's leaving, expect her to come back in some form soon enough like herpes. Anyways, I think we've delved into the deep end of despair and degeneracy for more than enough. We need a palate cleanser in the form of cute fan art. While I don't normally reveal to you guys the vague themes by which I select the fan art for my videos, I felt the need to mention that the theme for this video was Pondersprocket and Furries. <laughs> we'll start off with a bodacious bovine furry Pondersprocket by Ultra Trash Boy, getting across strength with that stance and them thick cow calves. Why did I write that line? <laughs> Fuck. Accompanied by some ever so soft shadows with that little extra shading to accent cute little details like that smile dimple and I think we can agree, made by the proverbial trash boy but serves as a veritable treasure to the eyes. For a different take on a furry ponder sprocket, we'll switch over to Mama Bear Ponder by I Am Tano Wolf, taking the mama bear phrase a little more literally here, once again giving us a strong stance, this time so that she can support Fiend's weight, all the while looking down on us like she knows we've done something wrong. 
even gave her a different outfit to go along with her new look. Taking flight, we have Pondersprocket fan art drawn as a hecking dragon by Dragon Drawing World. That's a very apt name. It's like if I named myself Dead Ocean Monsters Art. Look at how tiny Fiend is compared to her new monstrous form. Pushing Pondersprocket's brown skin into more of an orange to nicely contrast against the blue rings and wings. An excellent choice. Going for the glowy siren aesthetic, we have Pondersprocket by God's Demon 123 using a beautiful bright magenta to highlight her face amidst a sea of shining tentacle rings. Taking my oceanic themed characters to their natural extreme in a way that makes the most sense. It's so very easy to enjoy. Caught in the middle of the snowstorm that's been knocking out my power this week, it's Snowy Octomama by Crummy5, where Fiend has noticed their furry companion look away for a moment and he's using the opportunity to ready his aim. Run, furry child. He has eight arms prepped for death. Neat combination of the purple and orange character with the purple and blue ones, too. Creating avenues for jealousy, here's Sona Hugs Picture by Ori Bori. While Sprocket's concerning herself with the cute fuzzy furry friend, Fiend finds he's frustrated beyond function. <laughs> Aw, oh, poor baby so mad he's tearing up. Now how is he supposed to appreciate the cute cartoony style that Oribori has provided us? Seemingly ready to whip up some sciency type plan B, we have a Mind Flayer Fiend sticker by Izzy Cat, naively hinting towards actual canon lore while granting us an adorable octopus boy to admire. I very much love seeing alternate universe interpretations of these two, even turning Pondersprocket's dress into a fancy old robe for him. Very cute. XX Michimochi XX's character comes in sweeping the Octomama off her feet in this lovely sketch piece, seemingly showcasing the reality of the situation. Who and what? <laughs> Hey. Versus that one internal fantasy we all have at some point. Ha ha! Oh, so amazing! Giving us a pretty style and cute faces to go along with an adorable situation, because let's be real, who wouldn't want to pick Ponder Sprocket up and carry her all bridal style? Mochi's just doing what we all wish we could. And to move from sketches to line art, we see what happens when an artist you respect follows you back, as illustrated to us by Emmy Ann, apparently, who, as you can see here, has gorgeously adorable art Work. The subtle additions of the pink even helps to draw our eyes to the furry baby and away from Ponder Sprocket's intimidating eyeless stare of intrigue. Such fluff. Much investigate. Recognizing that even celestial cephalopods need head pats, here's Space Squid and Octomama by X the Gamer, with Ponder Sprocket providing a loving hand where needed. Clearly, it results in some well deserved contentment. I don't know what happened to this poor baby, but I think the head pats are justified. And since my friends should not be penalized for being my friends, by not having their work appear in the fan art feature, I want to take a little time away to appreciate Yuki Goomba's interpretations, both of my persona, in the form of this diabolically delectable demon bee done up as though I was a Vibzy Pop character, as well as my characters, as we have Ponder Sprocket dancing with Sparrow Knight, whom some of y'all may recognize now as Eternal Storyteller. Yuki's artwork is gorgeous and deserves to be seen. Then we'll shimmy on over to this cute chibi piece done by Doodle Tones, really getting across the sea goblin who will probably bite you vibes I normally radiate. For someone who claims up and down to not be an artist, Doodle Tones manages to grace us with some great green fun. I can't get over the cute little nubby ska shoes, feeling like a Powerpuff girl. And we'll finish off with He Promises He Has the Upper Hand by The Weird One, where the shock-inducing electrical weird finds himself pitted against the multi-armed madwoman. The contrast between the characters being equally expressed through the contrast of the warm and cool colors between them. However, will Weird get close enough to deliver a finishing blow amidst this whirling dervish of tentacles. Tune in next time on Dragon Ball Z. If you like any of these pieces, please don't hesitate to give the artist some love through the links that I have provided for you down in the description, as well as to all of my lovely editors for this fiasco. My links are also down there if you are so inclined. And with that, don't fuck your dog. Oh my god.